Welcome to Fanfiction Audiobook. Harry Potter. Sacrifice of All Things. Chapter 101. The person who stopped Filch was the headmaster Dumbledore. He had no doubt about the weight of Turner's words, but as the headmaster, he certainly couldn't let things continue to ferment. Because he was Dumbledore, and also the headmaster of this magic school. If it continued, in the end, whether Turner's took action against Filch or not, his authority would be questioned. And he didn't believe that Turner's was just angry, and he knew that Turner's would do what he said, but this situation was even worse. In any case, he was the headmaster of the school, and the school staff could be said to be his subordinates. No matter who was right or wrong in this matter, if he was under pressure from the board of directors, he would fire Filch. Then is it, 507, that there will be another one next, who will it be? Hagrid, Snape, or McGonagall? This is absolutely not allowed by Dumbledore, and he can't tolerate it. He doesn't doubt that Turner's doesn't have the strength to do what he wants to do. The Longbottom family, which is now in its heyday, has been able to rise in the past two years, mostly because of one person, the child in front of him. It is conceivable how much say Turner's has in the Longbottom family. If the Longbottom family, which is in its heyday, wants to fire a dud, no one will ever give them face because of this. It's just a matter of Turner's words. Although this is incredible, this is the fact. Dumbledore naturally can't sit idly by and watch such a thing. After all, Filch was just a little out of control because of Mrs. Norris's murder. Under normal circumstances, he is still a very competent administrator, at least he won't cause him any trouble, and he is still loyal to him. Okay, Filch, you are too excited, calm down. Seeing Dumbledore standing in front of him, even Filch, who was already extremely angry at this time, had to calm down. Although he was still a little unwilling, he couldn't disobey the headmaster's order. Looking at Filch who turned his head away, Turner's did not care about this matter anymore, he was just a clown after all. Mr. Turner's, I'm sorry for Filch's attitude, let's talk about Harry first. Dumbledore changed the subject. Well, okay. Turner's nodded in agreement. Mr. Potter, why did you hide the fact that you are a parcel tongue? Dumbledore asked. He didn't doubt Harry, but was a little curious. In his opinion, there was nothing worth hiding. Of course, this was just his idea. He didn't need to listen to Harry's explanation. A few days ago, I also heard this voice. At that time, I told Turner's and others that I didn't know that Parseltongue was a rare talent before. That's all they told me. In these days, I learned that Parseltongue is synonymous with dark wizards, so I'm worried. Harry was a little hesitant at the end and couldn't continue. But it's enough to say this. Dumbledore almost understood it. After all, children's views on some things are different from adults. They think of some things too extreme. From here on, Dumbledore had no doubts, because it was obvious, wasn't it? Dumbledore smiled slightly, using his smile to ease Harry's embarrassment and tension. Are you worried that we will regard you as a dark wizard? Faced with Dumbledore's question, Harry lowered his head in shame. Although he did think so in his heart, how could he admit such a shameful thing? I'm sorry, Professor. Harry lowered his head and said in a low voice. No, it's not your fault. You don't need to apologize or anything. However, you just said that you heard this voice a few days ago. When was it? Dumbledore did not dwell on this matter, but quickly grasped some important information in Harry's words. Yes, it was more than a week ago. At that time, Ronald and I were punished for the first time. I suddenly heard this voice. At that time, I planned to chase it, but it moved very quickly and I couldn't catch up. Harry said with a little regret. In this regard, the people present did not comment. After all, if Harry caught up, they might have been attending Harry's funeral at this time. Well, Turners, please continue to tell me what you have found. Dumbledore continued to Turners beside him. Well, through the information I have found these days, it has been basically confirmed that there are three types of snake-like magical creatures that can survive for thousands of years and have the ability to petrify or similar abilities. One is the basilisk. Their eyes have the potential to kill people if they look directly at them, and when they look at each other indirectly, they will petrify the target they are looking at. This is also the most likely one I think. The second is the Greek Medusa, a beautiful snake. Her eyes can petrify everyone who sees her, but this is a species that was created because of a curse. 
It is basically extinct, and no one knows what the curse is. I don't think it can be her. The last one is a snake from Japan named Shinya. This is a huge snake that can use its own venom to petrify people. This snake although it is possible, it is not very likely, because I did not see any traces of venom at the scene. Even if the scene was cleaned up, it is impossible that nothing was left. Listening to Turner's analysis, everyone's eyes lit up. Indeed, these three snake-like magical creatures all have the ability to petrify people. Moreover, Turner's has analyzed various possibilities and considered all possible problems. Through his research, he can basically determine what they are facing. But soon, they couldn't laugh again. It was because they knew all this that they felt it was difficult. Among them, the easiest to deal with must be the Japanese Shinya. Although its venom is also very strong, Turner's also said that it is very large and its magic resistance should be good. However, it was still very easy for the professors present to deal with it. But it was obvious that things could not be as they thought, that it was really Shinya. Their target had been determined long ago, and it should be the basilisk. This was a thousand-year-old basilisk. With the difficulty of this magical creature, even the professors in the academy might not be able to escape unscathed. Don't forget that the most famous thing about the basilisk is its magic eyes that can kill a person with a direct look. It was a bug-like existence. No one could maintain complete combat effectiveness when fighting it. You have to be on guard against its eyes at all times. If you can't look at the enemy, you can't judge the enemy's next move, and you can't predict how to respond to the next attack. Especially when the opponent is a magical creature that is likely to be very large and has amazing physical strength, it is even more disadvantageous. Of course, these are just my speculations. It is also possible that the petrification is not caused by the basilisk's eyes, but by some other black magic props or magic. It is not necessarily just another snake magic creature. However, Turner's comfort did not make everyone relax. Because no matter which possibility it is, they need to prepare a response and not let the possible attack happen again. Regarding the Chamber of Secrets incident, Dumbledore understood that this magical creature is very likely to be a white basilisk as Turner's guest. Because only in this way can it explain why there has been no attack before. If you rely on your personal strength to achieve the effect of petrifying misses. Norris, you must be at least a wizard at the level of the dean of the college, and you must be proficient in black magic. He doesn't believe that there is such a hidden existence among the teachers in Hogwarts. As for using magic props, that is impossible. Because if it is such a magic item, it is naturally impossible to hide it. When he uses this magic item, he will inevitably be contaminated with some magic aura, which is easy to detect. So, this point can be ruled out. Now, what they need to pay attention to is who is the person who opened the secret room. Only in this way can they prevent the next attack. And if they want to solve the problem fundamentally, the only solution is to get rid of the basilisk in the secret room. Only in this way can they fundamentally prevent the secret room incident from happening again in Hogwarts. Okay, Turners, we already know, you go back and rest first, and leave the next thing to us. Dumbledore waved his hand a little tiredly, asking Turners to go back together. Well, I know, then we will go first, Professor. After saying goodbye, Turners took the others back to the Gryffindor lounge. At this time, there are still many people staying in the public lounge. Most of them are senior students. Of course, there were also a few junior students who were very concerned about this incident and stayed here. Ronald, are you okay? As Ronald's brother, Percy still cared about his younger brother. When Ronald first came, he asked about them. It's okay, we are fine. This is not our fault. Principal Dumbledore just asked us a few questions. Ronald collapsed on the sofa weakly. Now he was really weak. He hadn't eaten for a whole night. It would be strange if he had the strength. Harry and Neville, who came back with Turners, were similar. They all looked dying. Seeing this, Hermione, who had been waiting here, handed the food in her hand to the three people, eat some quickly. This is the food Turners just packed. I'm worried that you won't have anything to eat at night. When they saw the food, the eyes of the three people turned green and they rushed to the open food packaging. They didn't care about the benefits or anything, they just got started and stuffed it into their mouths with their hands. 
Seeing the three people like this, even if the others were somewhat concerned about the progress of the previous events, they did not bother them. They didn't need this little time, so they let the three poor guys eat a little, and it wouldn't be too late to ask them later. The three people wolfed down for more than ten minutes before finally filling their empty stomachs with food. After drinking a glass of pumpkin juice with satisfaction, they were finally satisfied. Seeing that the situation was almost over, the others came up and began to ask about the previous situation. They didn't doubt Harry and the others, but they were mainly curious and wanted to find out what was going on. They just wanted to know who did such a good thing and helped them avenge their long-standing, revenge. To be honest, when they saw Mrs. Norris being petrified and hung on the wall lamp, many Hogwarts students did not feel fear in their hearts. Instead, they felt a sense of 900% gloating. After all, if a student had made a mistake, he would have been found by Mrs. Norris, and then there was Filch's eerie figure. These two combinations have always been the nightmare of naughty students. Now one of them is unlucky because of this incident. If they say that they don't feel gloating, that would be a lie. However, they don't have that emotion now. It's not that they start to sympathize with Filch, but because the legend of the Chamber of Secrets has never been a secret in Hogwarts. And they also know some specific reasons why the monsters in the Chamber of Secrets exist. Therefore, they are more worried about their own safety now, and want to know more about the situation, just to know what is going on and whether the Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Under the questioning of everyone, Harry and the others can only answer their questions. After everyone asked, Harry and the others started to feel dry in the mouth again. There were so many people asking questions that they didn't even have time to drink water. However, after asking so many questions, there were only a few people who actually told them the news. After all, they were not allowed to know about the secret chamber. Even if they were told, it should not be Harry and his friends, but the professors of the school who should reveal some information is appropriate. After that, everyone went to their bedrooms to rest, as they still had classes tomorrow. After everyone left, they did not notice that in a dark corner, there was a small figure, which slowly emerged from the shadows. Long red hair, a slightly fat face with freckles, and obvious features, it was the youngest member of the Weasley family, Ginny Weasley. But at this moment, she seemed to be in a state that was a little wrong, with a gloomy face, not like a little girl. Her eyes were fixed on the entrance of the boys' dormitory, as if there was someone there, which made her very hateful. But something even more bizarre happened. Just as Ginny was staring at the boys' dormitory with hatred, suddenly, her face stiffened, and then her whole face became pale, without a trace of blood. The expression that was originally a little bit cold in hatred also turned into a look of fear and terror in an instant. This sudden change of face was even faster than turning a book, without the slightest sign. Ginny seemed to know something, and quickly reached into her arms. Sure enough, she touched something. The same thing that made her lose consciousness, and the same thing that appeared here after she woke up. Ginny looked at the diary she took out of her arms with some fear, and felt very scared. She wanted to throw it away, but she couldn't bear to do it. Because this diary was the only place where she could say some true words in this school. This is a notebook with an old black cover, which looks like it has some traces of time. After hesitating for a while, Ginny finally didn't throw it away, but grabbed the notebook, ran into her dormitory quickly, put the notebook on the table beside her, and hid in her bed with some fear and trembling. Perhaps because of excessive fright, or for some other reason, Ginny fell asleep as soon as she lay in the bed. The diary that Ginny cared about very much just lay quietly on the table. The next day, when everyone woke up, people all over the campus were discussing the Chamber of Secrets and the Slytherin air. Even in Professor McGonagall's Transfiguration class, Hermione couldn't help asking about the Slytherin Chamber of Secrets. Professor McGonagall, who used to take classes very seriously, unusually told everyone about the Chamber of Secrets. However, she did not reveal that the monster in the Chamber of Secrets was a thousand-year-old basilisk. After all, they could not let students know about such things. Once they knew, it would definitely cause a great panic in the school. This would be very detrimental to the entire school, and this was not what the professors wanted to see. Teachers of various subjects have been asked about the news of the Chamber of Secrets. 
Of course, Turnus didn't care about these things, but it didn't mean that he didn't worry about the basilisk. But even if he was worried, it would be useless. He would attack when he should. He couldn't live in fear every day. Turnus was still very concerned about his own safety. On the one hand, he was also thinking about how to deal with the death gaze of the basilisk. On the other hand, he tried not to act alone as much as possible. In addition, his five senses were sharp. Every time he passed by a corner, he would listen carefully to see if there was any problem before he walked over. At the same time, he was also making some props specifically for reconnaissance during this period to prevent any accidents. However, for now, it would take some time. After all, making such props is not a simple matter. It requires sufficient magic knowledge. And these are only temporary solutions. The best way is to make a magic prop that can resist the death gaze of the basilisk. Only in this way can he be absolutely sure, and even if he really has to fight the basilisk, he can minimize the probability of accidents. This is not a simple project, even Dumbledore has no good solution. The only thing he can think of is to use the magic immunity of Phoenix Fox to destroy the two eyes of the basilisk, so that he can fight the basilisk with confidence. This news is not guessed by Turner's, for he knows something in advance, but he has personally asked Dumbledore, Dumbledore admitted it himself, and he has no other calendar. Therefore, in terms of the death gaze against the basilisk, he has to find a way himself. Turner's only hopes to find a solution as soon as possible, otherwise, he can only avoid confronting the basilisk as much as possible. You will never know which one will come first, the surprise or the accident. Turners will never put hope on Dumbledore's ability to find the secret room. If it can really be found so easily, Dumbledore would have found it long ago. You know, the rumor about the Chamber of Secrets is not because it has been circulating here for more than a thousand years. It is because, in the past hundred years, the Chamber of Secrets has been opened once, and someone died in the school that time, which caused a great commotion at the time, and even Hogwarts was almost closed. Turners will definitely not rely on Dumbledore to solve the problem, and he must keep some backup plans. Even if he doesn't really have to fight the basilisk, at least when an accident happens, he can have enough means to deal with it. However, such means are indeed difficult to find. After all, in this world, if even Dumbledore can't find a way to deal with the eyes of the basilisk, then it is basically impossible for him to find any way. It's not that Turners is self-deprecating, but it's the fact. You have to know that Dumbledore's experience and his many means can almost be said to have reached the pinnacle of this world. If even such a person can't do it, Turners doesn't think that with his current background, he can get a solution halfway. Fortunately, Turners has other ways and channels. He can seek solutions from other worlds by sacrificing on the altar. This is what Turners had thought of from the beginning. Ever since Turnus found out that the basilisk was powerful and difficult to deal with, he has been offering sacrifices continuously. It was to find a solution as soon as possible. It was a pity that, although he had obtained some good things from other worlds, he still had no idea how to solve the basilisk's death gaze. As time went by, the days passed, and the weather was not very good recently. However, Harry and Neville had never fallen behind in Quidditch training. That's right, the two had passed the Gryffindor Quidditch selection long before. During this period, in addition to helping Hagrid bring the excavated soil to Turnus, they were busy with Quidditch training. Although the weather was very bad, they did not slack off in Quidditch training. They were still enthusiastically engaged in training every day. Harry joined the team as the team seeker, while Neville 443 was not. He was a substitute player and stayed in the audience for the time being. Although his physical strength was very high, even comparable to other seniors. However, after all, his age was there, and his own weight was always a problem. When colliding with others, he was still at a disadvantage. This was not the most important thing. The most important thing was that the Quidditch team was not short of people for the time being. With the full staff, Neville could only stay below. However, Wood had made it clear that when some sixth-year students wanted to retire, he could immediately fill their vacancies. This was also a little comfort to Neville. After all, Neville's body was indeed very strong. As long as he was stronger, he could join the national team. Being able to join the Gryffindor team was also a blessing for Gryffindor. As the captain of the Quidditch team, Wood naturally had to grasp Neville, a good seedling. 
Although he was a substitute, his daily training was in accordance with the regular players of CJBC, which was to make Neville adapt to the rhythm on the court and be ready to play at any time. As for Turner's, he continued to lie in the dormitory, making bricks while constantly offering sacrifices. No matter what it was, as long as he caught it, he would throw it directly on the altar, just to try his luck. And today, Turner's luck seemed to be very good. He saw that the spirit body condensed in the altar space, while controlling the magic circle to refine bricks, casually threw a long sword on the altar, and then the light of the altar gradually began to spread. As the entire altar was covered by the light, the long sword on the altar disappeared on the altar after a flash. Such scenes have shocked Turner's countless times, especially in the past few days, in order to find a way to solve the death gaze of the basilisk, he has made no less than 10,000 sacrifices. When the light completely disappeared, the things obtained from this sacrifice also appeared before his eyes. This time, a card appeared. The only result of such a thing is that he will gain a new skill. Although he doesn't know what it is, such a thing, no matter what skill it is, is very worthwhile for Turnus. Turnus is looking forward to what skill he can get this time. After all, this is a very foreseeable situation. He quickly put down the half-refined earth brick in his hand and ran to the altar. The closer he got to the card, the more excited Turnus became. Such a card has not appeared many times in the past few years. He couldn't wait to pick up the card, and at the same time, he closed his eyes and waited for the altar to convey the information of this card to his mind. After fully understanding it, Turnus' eyes suddenly widened and looked at the card in his hand in disbelief. It's a big explosion. And it's exactly what I need. My luck has exploded. Turnus looked at the pattern on the card excitedly. There was nothing extra on the card, just some vague outlines in the darkness, and then there were spots of light in these outlines. It was a very simple display picture. At first glance, you didn't even know what it meant, and it would make people confused. However, after knowing the name of this card, all doubts will be solved. Of course, the premise is that you must have watched an anime called one piece, otherwise you still don't know the meaning of this card. The name of this card is, Observation Hockey. That's right, it is an ability in the anime that Turn has watched in his previous life, a special perception ability that can judge the direction, position and other 10 series of information of the enemy's attack without any senses. Although this card represents only the intermediate Observation Hockey, Turn has, who has watched the anime, knows very well how powerful this card is. Especially after this card appeared in this world, in this unnoticed in a world with heavy bodies, everyone's movements are so slow. After possessing the observation hockey, Turnus can even sense the position they are going to attack before they raise their hands. Such an ability basically means being invincible in this world. Moreover, more importantly, this card is exactly what Turnus urgently needs now. The power of observation hockey lies in that the person who learns it can perceive many situations around him through observation hockey. For example, if someone wants to attack him, he can sense it without even seeing, hearing, touching, etc. Observation hockey is more like an intuition, a premonition. Therefore, even if you don't see or hear, you can fight, and basically it will not limit your combat power. It can be said that it is the most suitable ability for his current situation. This is a big prize. Turnus looked at the card in his hand with joy. What is he hesitating about? Immediately, Turnus used the card in his hand. As Turnus made his choice, the cards in his hand also scattered into a burst of light and disappeared in his hand. Then, he felt his mind suddenly empty, and then a mysterious feeling appeared in Turnus' mind. This is a very wonderful feeling, he can feel everything around him without looking. Whether it is a dead object or something else, it can directly convey the feeling to his brain. This feeling is really very wonderful, making him feel like he can't stop. Turnus felt the information conveyed back by the observation hockey, tried to close his eyes, and walked down only relying on his perception. Step by step, at the beginning, he was a little uncomfortable because of the sudden loss of vision, but gradually, he gradually began to get used to it. The pace of his feet became faster and faster, and soon he walked to the side of the alchemy array he had put down before. Reaching out and groping on the alchemy array, the alchemy array that had gradually extinguished, was turned on again. 
Just as Turner's continued to refine the earth bricks, a strange feeling suddenly appeared in his mind. This feeling was very strange, somewhat similar to what was said in the novel, that kind of spiritual consciousness of the cultivator directly fed back the detected information to the spirit to let you know your surroundings directly. This was different from his autonomous perception just now. This perception was passive. He didn't do anything, but he could know that someone was approaching. Turner's felt very magical. He didn't expect that this observation hockey had a passive effect, and it seemed not weak. He returned to reality from the sacrificial space and slowly opened his eyes. What caught his eyes was Harry, Ronald, and Neville's embarrassed figure. These three people seemed to have just returned from the Quidditch training outside. You are back, how do you feel today? Turners couldn't help but joked as he looked at the embarrassed three people. Harry and Neville were okay. After all, they were inevitable and definitely needed to participate in training. But Ronald was a little strange. He was not suitable for Quidditch at his current age. However, for some reason, even if it rained, he would go to the stadium with Harry and the others, and even if he just watched from the side, he still enjoyed it. Ronald was not dissatisfied with Turner's as jokes. His love for Quidditch made him not care about these hardships. Instead, he excitedly told Turners about some of the situations Harry and the others encountered during training. To be honest, Turners really couldn't praise the Quidditch sport in the wizarding world. It was a sport where a group of people flew around in the sky, grabbed a few balls, and chased the golden snitch. Turners really had no interest in it. Otherwise, with his physical fitness that was better than Neville's and his flying talent that was better than Harry's, he would have become a formal member of Quidditch long ago. However, Turners recently discovered that there were indeed fewer entertainment activities in the wizarding world. In addition to the wizard chess that everyone can play, there was only Quidditch left in sports. To be honest, Ness hasn't seen much of the others in the past few years. Sometimes Turners wonders if he can make a game to enrich his life. Of course, this is definitely not now. The world is not peaceful. If he delays his progress in improving his strength because of playing, he will regret it in the end. Before reaching Dumbledore's level, Turnus will not put more energy into playing. To be honest, in this world, there are almost no wizards who can reach the level of wizards. Sometimes, there will not be one for dozens or hundreds of years. This era is also relatively disaster-ridden. Decades ago, the German black wizard Grindelwald disturbed the entire wizard world. Unexpectedly, not long after he was dealt with, another one appeared. The only thing to be thankful for is that this black wizard is currently only active in the Great Eagle Country and has not yet extended his hands outside. Within a hundred years, three wizards of the wizard level appeared in succession, and two of them were dark wizards. Such luck is unparalleled. Fortunately, they still have the only and strongest white wizard Dumbledore. It was he who helped the world escape the endless darkness twice in a row. Turners set his goal on Dumbledore, which seemed a bit overestimating his own ability and thinking too far. However, in Turners's view, this is not a difficult task. Think about it, when Dumbledore was 12 years old, could he reach the peak of an intermediate wizard? This is obviously impossible. At this time, Dumbledore can have the strength of a junior wizard, which is already very good. Besides, Turners has a lot of resources in his hands. Among them are many precious resources from other worlds. With the support of these things, Turners will not need much time to reach Dumbledore's level, even if he surpasses him. By that time, let alone Voldemort who was still lingering on, even if he reached the peak level, he would not dare to stand in front of Turnus. And he only needed to use his powerful strength to directly suppress the world, so that the entire wizarding world could maintain peace, not for anything else, just because he needed the peace of the world. At that time, Shines could do whatever he wanted. Okay, you guys quickly pack up and get ready to rest. We have a holiday tomorrow, so it's a good time to go to Hagrid's place, support part of the underground space first, and settle Norbo down. He has been very dishonest recently. Well, we know. As they said, the three of them accelerated their actions, began to wash up, and prepared to go to bed. Turnus also planned to go to bed. As he said, he would be busy tomorrow. The next day, after the five people had breakfast early, they ran quickly towards Hagrid's cabin. Draco, who was eating at the Slytherin table nearby, 
saw the five people in such a hurry that he didn't care about eating anymore. He picked up two pieces of bread and ran out of the village. Crab and Goyle, who were standing by, were about to follow, but were stopped by Draco. They must not let these two idiots know about their dragon-raising business. They might let it slip at any time. Not only would his dragon be gone, but he would also be punished. Draco quickly caught up with the five people and followed them all the way to Hagrid's cabin. When they arrived here, Hagrid was also having breakfast. These days, for Nobo, Hagrid has also worked hard. Every day, he doesn't care about time. As long as he has free time and rest, he comes down here to keep digging the space inside. Every day is spent in busyness. In addition to completing the tasks assigned to him by the academy, he basically spends his time here. 100, of course, hard work pays off. After such a long time of digging, Hagrid has successfully opened up a space with an area of more than 2,000 square meters below. Moreover, the height of this place has reached more than 20 meters, which basically meets the requirements. Now what they have to do is to help this space successfully arrange the traceless extension spell during the two-day holiday, so that the space here can be used to the maximum extent to meet Nobo's needs. Of course, even if they arrange the traceless extension spell now, it does not mean that they don't have to worry about it anymore. They still need to do more work and they will be busy in the future. When they came here, Hagrid was eating. When he saw that the six people had come, he immediately put down the black bread in his hand, packed it up casually and prepared to work. For him, Nobo's matter was the most important. As for his meals, it didn't matter if he skipped a meal. Besides, he had almost eaten. He was the most active in finding a new place for Nobo, otherwise he wouldn't have made such a fast progress and dug up enough space so quickly. Now that you are here, let's get started. I am very happy to think that Nobo can have his own territory. If Nobo knew about it, he would be so happy. He he he. Hagrid said, not knowing what he was thinking of, he couldn't help but grin. Looking at Hagrid like this, Turns really didn't know what to say, and didn't know whether they were raising dragons or sons. Hagrid and Draco were almost dragon slaves. However, he also knew that Hagrid's personality was like this. When facing those huge magical creatures, he had no resistance at all and always wanted to make friends with them. He really liked them too much. That is, Hagrid's body was huge, and there would be no volume suppression in the process of communication. If it were an ordinary person, if he wanted to do this to Hagrid, it would really be fatal. Of course, this also made it easy for Hagrid to get the recognition of those creatures and play with them, which also made Hagrid has many strong friends. In this dragon-raising process, even Draco, who has always looked down on this half-giant, has to admit that Hagrid obviously does a better job than himself in taking care of Nobo. Although this is also related to the fact that he is still a student and does not have much time to spend with him. But it is undeniable that Hagrid's love for Nobo is beyond words. Hagrid brought Turnas and the others to the underground space, where a large space had been dug out, which should be enough for Nobo's territory. Of course, this was after the traceless extension spell was arranged, which is obviously not possible now. Moreover, in order to be Nobo's territory, some other arrangements need to be made here, not only for protection, but also for the environment, which also requires a lot of effort. There is still a lot to do to make a territory for Nobo. Turnus took out the materials he had prepared in advance from the space, and together with Hermione, began to arrange them around. Through these months of research and practice, Hermione has a very deep understanding of the traceless extension spell. Moreover, during the summer vacation, she also successfully reached the level of a junior magician because of that cup of magic source potion. Her own magic control is also very advanced, if it is just to help Turnus, it is completely enough. In other words, there is Hermione's help was needed. Otherwise, if Turners had done it alone, it would not be done in two days. At least one more day would be needed. Of course, there were other people who helped. Although they could not help with the arrangement of the traceless extension spell, they could still do some preliminary work. For example, before they arranged the magic inscriptions of the traceless extension spell, they could use the strengthening magic of, solid and stable, to strengthen the surrounding earthen cave walls so that they could better arrange the magic inscriptions. 
It was not required that they reach no matter how strong it is, it only needs to be able to bear the magic inscriptions that are not worth them. The protective settings here are not achieved by them, but need to be rearranged after the traceless extension spell. Otherwise, if they have high hopes for such a spell, they will be buried alive. It is a foolish dream to want to defend against the destruction of the fire dragon with a spell. In the next two days of vacation, Turners and his team can be said to have experienced the hard work of working overtime. After breakfast 4.0 every day, they hurried to Hagrid's hut started to get busy, and they would not go back until late at night, taking the time to rest, recuperate, and wait for the next day's work. Fortunately, they finally finished the work in these two days. This was also thanks to Turnus's hand, which had some magic recovery potions that could support everyone's magic consumption. Although the consumption was a bit large, it finally supported everyone's magic consumption in these two days, and did not delay the completion time. Huh. It's finally done, but I'm so tired. Turnus finally breathed a sigh of relief after fixing the last mithril wire in the wall. After two days of arrangement, the magic circle of the traceless extension spell was finally arranged. The next thing to do is to activate the formation, let the traceless stretching spell take effect, and expand this underground space. How is it? It's okay. Do you want to take a break? Hermione asked with concern. In the next few hours, her work was basically completed. She could take a break in the last little time, but Turner's was different. From beginning to end, he had no chance to stop. He was always working at a high intensity. His body must be very tired, and more importantly, he was mentally exhausted. It's okay, the next thing is relatively simple. I'll take a break after I finish it. Turner's waved his hand to indicate that he didn't care. Under Turner's leadership, they came to the center of the entire underground space. Hagrid deliberately left a pillar here, with a diameter of about 3 meters. This will become the energy center of the entire underground space, mainly to provide energy to the surrounding magic inscriptions to ensure that the magic inscriptions here can continue to operate. In terms of the energy supply of magic inscription 29, Turner's has also found something that can ensure sufficient energy here. That is a very huge flame crystal in his hand. This flame crystal was obtained by chance when Turnus was offering sacrifices these days. It is also the best thing he has obtained these days, except for the observation hockey. This flame crystal is rhombus shaped, 1 meter square in size, and contains a rich fire attribute Kuang magic energy zone. It only needs simple guidance, and the magic power in it can be used to supply the energy consumption of the magic inscriptions in this underground space. Of course, the reason why Turnus uses the flame crystal is not entirely because of its huge energy. After all, no matter how huge the energy is, it will be useful one day. The main reason is that the energy of the fire attribute is more convenient to replenish. Don't forget that the next owner here is a fire dragon, and Nobo's dragon breath is the best magic supplement. It is for this reason that Turnus will replace the magic energy that has been prepared with one. Originally, Turnus wanted to plant a tree here, and then let KK use life magic to promote its growth to supply the energy consumption here. Although this requires KK to come here every once in a while to replenish the wood attribute magic energy, it is quite troublesome and a bit wasteful. However, compared with changing the energy core every time, this is much more convenient. As long as KK is there, the energy core does not need to be moved. But now, there is a better choice, and Turnus naturally chooses to change the plan. Turnus put the flame crystal into the earth pillar in front of him, and then connected it with the magic inscription outside with a silk thread made of mithril. After everything was done, Turnus began to wave his wand and activate the magic circle of the entire underground space. When Turnus waved his wand, everyone only felt that in front of them, there was a very pure and huge flame magic in the earth pillar, and it began to spread in the surrounding space. When the entire underground space was shrouded by this magic, a magical picture appeared in front of them. It was as if their bodies were shrinking, but the fact was that the space around them was constantly expanding and never stopped. It was not until more than 10 minutes later that the surrounding environment finally stabilized. After all the changes in the surroundings were over, Shines and his team began to observe the entire appearance of the surrounding environment. Originally, the height of this space was more than 20 meters, but now it is indeed different. 
The height of this space has reached more than 50 meters, and this is just the average height. The original space of more than 2,000 square meters has now expanded a lot. Although it is not clear how big it is, Tinas believes that the size here is enough for Nobo to perform. Of course, Nobo must not be allowed to come in now, otherwise, with just one claw, Nobo can destroy the magic inscriptions they have worked so hard to arrange. At the same time, Tinas and his team have no time to continue the next work. The two-day vacation is about to end, and they have to go to class tomorrow, so they don't have the time to stay here. In addition, the Quidditch House Cup match between Slytherin and Gryffindor will be held this week. Neither Harry nor Draco has the time to stay here. In the next week, they all need to participate in the training of the house team. The work of perfecting the Dragon Cave can only wait until a week later. In the next period of time, Turner's also needs to prepare the materials for, decorating, the Dragon Cave as soon as possible. Although some materials have been prepared now, they are still far from the required materials. In the next period of time, he still needs to work harder. However, since there is no pressure from the threat of the basilisk, Turner's mood has also relaxed a lot, and he is no longer too depressed. Even Hermione has noticed these changes in him. Isn't it just that the traceless extension spell of the dragon cave has been built? Is there any need to be so happy? Hermione said speechlessly. Well, although she is also very happy, after all, this traceless extension spell was set up by her, although the main arrangement work was not completed by her. But she undoubtedly put a lot of effort into the creation of the dragon cave. But she shouldn't be as happy as Turnus. She didn't know that Turnus was not so happy just because of a dragon cave. Turnus didn't explain anything, but changed the subject. How do you plan to spend the next Christmas? Will you stay with your family or stay in school? What about you? How are you going to spend it? Hermione was also very entangled about this, although she wanted to go back to spend Christmas. However, she felt that it was really unfair to leave all the remaining work of the dragon cave to Turnus. As for Harry and the others, Hermione didn't expect them at all. It was okay to let them use some simple magic, but asking them to help Turnus complete the subsequent transformation of the dragon cave was not to look down on them, but it was too difficult for them. As for me, I will stay in school. I don't plan to go back this year. After all, there are too many things in school and I can't leave for the time being. Although Hermione knew that Turns would definitely make this decision, she was still a little entangled when she heard it. Should she go back? Soon Hermione made a decision, which was to stay in school with Turns. Then I will stay and help you. It's just in time for you to teach me more magic. Hermione found a reason for herself and chose to stay. This is good. We can take advantage of this time to speed up the progress of the Dragon Cave. At least decorate part of it first and let Noble move in first. He is getting more and more irritable now. Maybe he has really grown up. Turner's was also somewhat helpless. Nobo is really a worry now. The suitcase he lived in before has been repaired by Dooners for the third time. If he is not dealt with quickly, there will be more troubles like this in the future. Hermione swallowed the food in her mouth and said with a smile, Yes, Nobo is getting more and more lively now. He really can't be locked up anymore. It's time to give him some space to move around. Quote. Hermione, who had done special research on this aspect, knew something about the habits of dragons. She also knew that Norbo was in adolescence and was very active. He was indeed a little irritable when he was locked in a box. Turner's rolled his eyes helplessly. To be honest, Norbo was really not pleasing to Turner's. If he hadn't agreed to let Hagrid help him raise dragons, Turner's would have quit long ago. It's only because Hagrid is here, otherwise I would have put a dog chain on him. How could he be so arrogant? He even spit at me yesterday. Next time, when Hagrid is not around, I'll see how I deal with him. Quote. Looking at Turnus's indignant expression, Hermione laughed unkindly, Yes, yes, you are the best, but don't leave any external injuries, otherwise Hagrid will cry again. Thinking of Hagrid crying like a child because of Norbo's injury, Turnus couldn't help but laugh out loud. What are you talking about? You look so happy. Just when Turnus and the other man were chatting happily, Harry's curious figure came from behind. Harry and Neville were wearing Gryffindor's red uniforms and holding two brooms in their hands. 
Ronald followed them, scanning the surroundings vigilantly, like a bodyguard. Seeing this trio, Turnus raised his eyes, are you all ready? How do you feel? This time, we must teach Draco, that arrogant guy, a lesson. Don't be suppressed by their momentum. Hearing Turnus' words, Harry smiled confidently, of course there is no problem. This time we are well prepared. Although each of them has a Nimbus 2001, our flying brooms are not bad either. Don't worry, Turnus, this time as long as I can play, I will definitely kill Slytherin without a single piece of armor left. Neville also said confidently on the side. In terms of Quidditch, Neville, who has been playing since childhood, is not inferior to anyone. That would be the best. The reason why Turnus hated Slytherin so much was because of Draco. His personality was like that. As long as he was in the upper hand, he would be arrogant. Before, because the Quidditch of Slytherin College was funded by the Malfoy family, everyone received a Nimbus 2001, so he started to show off and actually ran to Turnus to show off. Turnus would not spoil him at that time. He immediately cast a spell to let him and his flying broom fly into the sky and feel the experience of being shoulder to shoulder with the sun. It flew in the sky for more than two hours before finally stopping. However, Turnus would not let him go so easily. Not only did he want him to feel physical torture, but he also wanted him to be mentally and politically hit. And what could be better than being directly defeated in Quidditch? Besides, there was never peace between Harry and Draco. When the two of them were together, they were either competing or bickering. Turnus didn't need to say much. Well, you are really petty. It's been so long, and you still remember it. Besides, didn't he get a lesson at that time? Hermione stood up for Draco. However, it would be better if she could restrain the smile on her lips. Turners looked at Hermione who couldn't help laughing, rolled his eyes, and laughed if he wanted to, don't hold it back and hurt yourself. Quote. Hermione's face flushed with shame, and she slapped Turnus in the face. Her coquettish look was really tempting. After a few glances, Turnus quickly retracted his gaze, and at the same time silently recited the Ice Heart Sutra in his mind. He silently warned himself in his heart that it was illegal to be a Lolita, it was illegal to be a Lolita. Because the Quidditch match was about to start, the group did not delay for long. After a quick lunch, they all went to the Quidditch field. Even so, when they arrived, the place was already full of people, and each college had its own stand. Turnus and his friends came to the Gryffindor stand and found a better position. They put out the various magical creations with a strong Gryffindor style that they had prepared to boost morale. There were old sheets with the Gryffindor logo carved with magic, and there were also Gryffindor pennants made with some pieces of clothing. There was also a good, large banner that was held high just at the top of the Gryffindor stand. Turner's was naturally prepared, and he took out a bludger from his pocket. Of course, it just looked like a bludger, and it was definitely not a bludger. And its colors were the gold and red of Gryffindor. Turner's took out the ball and tapped it twice with his wand. After a burst of magic light, the spherical object turned into a golden lion, and on the lion was a bright red robe with the Gryffindor logo and cheering slogans on it. The lion was very large, and it directly occupied the Gryffindor stand. However, his illusory body did not affect the Gryffindor students from watching the next match. At first, no one else noticed this. When the lion opened its mouth and roared, everyone was attracted by the majestic lion and saw the cheerleaders on the Gryffindor stand. Turnus looked at the lion's performance and felt very satisfied. He waved his wand again and the lion roared again, showing the momentum of the Gryffindor cheerleaders. As time went by, the entire Quidditch game officially began. As a substitute, Neville did not play at this time, but Harry had already followed the team to the stadium. When the Gryffindor players saw that there was a majestic lion among the people cheering for them in the Gryffindor audience, they were all very excited as if they had been injected with chicken blood. George and Fred even rode on flying brooms and flew over the Gryffindor audience, shouting excitedly. Turnus also controlled the lion and roared in response. Soon, under the auspices of Ms. Hooch, the Quidditch match officially began. From the beginning of the game, the flames between the Gryffindor and Slytherin teams were very strong. Slytherin had a certain advantage because of the Malfoy family's Nimbus 2001. Fortunately, the Gryffindor players were also very strong. Although they were at a disadvantage in equipment, 
they were able to recover some of their personal strength. Turnus was in the stands, constantly cheering for the Gryffindor team, and from time to time, the lion would roar. Although he could not help much on the court, at least in terms of the momentum of the cheerleading team, they crushed all other colleges. As the two key people who decided the game, Harry and Draco, the two of them naturally attracted the attention of most people. From the beginning of the game, the two have been together, constantly looking for the key to ending the game, the mysterious golden snitch. This thing is not easy to find. It is very small. Although it is golden and smooth, it is easy to reflect light when exposed to light. However, the situation on the field is very complicated. If you don't look carefully, you can't detect the little trace at all. Therefore, in this regard, if you want to be a good seeker, you can't just have good equipment, but also need a lot of talent. Only in this way can you find the golden snitch as soon as possible and win the key 150 points for the team. Although all the players on the field are doing their best and constantly contributing to their own teams. And the audience under the field are also cheering for their respective teams. But Turners found that today's game didn't seem so peaceful. Not long after the game started, an invisible hand began to control some things. On the field, a wandering ball stared at Harry very strangely, as if it was deliberately targeting him. It didn't care about the other team members at all, but kept staring at Harry, attacking him, and madly crashing into Harry. However, no one found it strange. In their opinion, it was a very normal thing. In the Quidditch game, there are indeed two bludgers, constantly wandering around and attacking all the players. This is a consensus among everyone, and the two batsmen in the Quidditch team are responsible for protecting other players. Of course, they can also intentionally hit the bludgers at the players of the other team to attack. Such behavior is in compliance with regulations in Quidditch games. Moreover, if they can knock down the players of other teams, they will also get cheers. However, the behavior of this bludger now obviously exceeds the function of a normal bludger. It is no longer aimed at the players on the entire court, but only at one person, that is, Harry. Although others have not noticed anything, because this seems normal to them, at most they think Harry is unlucky and is targeted by a bludger. But in Turner's opinion, it is different, because he has already obtained the ability of observation hockey a few days ago and noticed something unusual. Those who know about observation hockey know that it is a very powerful perception ability that can perceive many things. Through this ability, Turnus can clearly perceive that there is an unusual energy on this bludger. This energy is very slightly different from the energy on the other bludger. Because this difference is very small, it is definitely not perceptible if you don't perceive it carefully. In addition, the magic power of the bludger itself covers this strange magic fluctuation, which makes other people not notice anything wrong. However, such a small fluctuation cannot be hidden from Turnus's observation hockey perception. Turnus knows that someone should have cast other magic on this bludger, and his or their target must be Harry Potter. Now the reason why they did this is still unclear, but such an obvious attack tendency is obviously not a friendly signal. Although he has noticed something, Turnus did not act rashly to stop this Quidditch game. After all, he couldn't let this little change affect the development of the College Cup. Besides, he didn't have such power. He just used his observation hockey to carefully sense the source of this magic power based on the slight fluctuation of magic power. Although it was very subtle, there were still traces to follow, and Turnus didn't have no clue. On the other hand, he wrote his findings on a piece of paper and quietly handed it to Hermione beside him. Hermione didn't understand at first, but after seeing the content on the paper, she soon knew what to do. Immediately, she left the audience and ran in an unknown direction. And he himself was still using observation hockey to sense the magic fluctuations on the bludger and find the person who attacked Harry. However, the progress did not seem to be very smooth. Even with Turnus's perception, it was difficult to capture this subtle magic fluctuation. Even if he had already used his observation hockey to the extreme, the progress was still very slow. In addition, the surrounding environment was a bit complicated, and it was easy to lose track of a subtle magic fluctuation, which required Turnus to concentrate and carefully perceive the surroundings. Turnus concentrated on looking for this unknown magic fluctuation. Time passed by, and he was getting closer and closer to the truth. 
Just when he was about to capture the source of the magic fluctuation, something unexpected happened. The magic fluctuation was instantly cut off, and Turna's previous actions were declared to be in vain. Everything turned into a waste of effort. Turnas was slightly stunned. He thought he was discovered. In order not to be exposed, the other party cut off the magic connection. But now there is only one last step to the final truth. How can he be willing to fail? Immediately, the observation hockey gushed out crazily. In just a moment, the area he traced was completely covered by the perception of the observation hockey, and the breath of everyone was locked. However, it was obvious that it was too late at this time. He could already sense obvious magical fluctuations in this area, and he could clearly confirm that this magical aura was, apparition. Obviously, the other party was very cunning and had used apparition to escape as soon as the incident occurred. At this time, Turner's could only withdraw his attention, and this time the pursuit could only end in failure. Although Turner's was a little disappointed, he had no other way. The other party slipped away too quickly, leaving him no chance to pursue. Turner's did not know the other party's purpose this time, but he thought that he would not want to kill Harry directly. After all, it was impossible to do this with just a bludger. Even if this method was successful, it would at most break Harry's hands and feet, and would not cause much harm to Harry's life. When Turnas retracted his attention, he saw Harry, who was already holding the golden snitch high and wandering happily in the field. He also knew why the other party gave up, because the Quidditch game was over. However, this victory did not seem to be recognized by the Slytherin students, but was rather controversial. At this time, they were booing Harry in the field, which was not a friendly way to express. Turnus had not paid attention to the game in the field just now, so he did not know why the Slytherin students had such a big opinion. Even though Harry won, he still faced the other party with such an attitude. He threw his doubts to Ronald beside him and asked him to explain it to him. Oh my god, were you distracted just now? In such a grand game, you were able to. Looking at Turna's dangerous eyes, Ronald wisely did not continue to speak, but began to explain Turna's doubts. It was not until this time that Turners realized that just before, when he was tracking down the mastermind, Harry had already been in a mess because of the out-of-control bludger. Despite this, Harry still found the snitch and chased after it. But at the end, the bludger's attack became more and more crazy. Just when it was about to hit Harry and cause him to be seriously injured, Dumbledore, who was sitting in the teacher's seat, could no longer sit idly by and directly fix the bludger in midair. As a result, Harry, who would have been seriously injured by the bludger, got the snitch very smoothly and finally won the game successfully. Turnus knew all the reasons and understood it. Dumbledore would not watch Harry get injured by the obviously problematic bludger. However, others who really didn't know the reason just thought that Dumbledore was deliberately biased. Especially for the students of Slytherin College, this was obviously destroying the fairness of the game in their opinion, which made them doubt the fairness of this Quidditch. Even Snape, the headmaster of Slytherin, walked towards the teacher's seat angrily, obviously wanting to question Dumbledore why he interfered with this game. Of course, the final result is obvious. The bludger is still in Dumbledore's hand. Although it has lost its magic interference, the small spell on it is still there, although it is not as obvious as before. But after all, it was once cast with magic, which is still easy to recognize. This alone is enough to explain everything. After that, things were relatively simple. Snape, the headmaster of Slytherin, had been convinced, and the others could be easily dealt with. The heads of each college also explained the fairness of the game to their students. As for the inside story, few people knew it. This is not a trivial matter, so the fewer people who know about it, the better. After the game, Hermione came back and found Turnus. Turnus, Principal Dumbledore is waiting for you in the office, go quickly, the password is Sherry Sugar. Turnus had expected it, nodded and said, okay, I know, you go find Harry and the others first, this is their first time to participate in Quidditch, they must be very excited now. I'll explain the situation and then find you. Okay, then go quickly, the sooner you go, the sooner you come back. Hermione also knew that the principal wanted to find Turnus for something, so she didn't ask much, and followed the students of Gryffindor College back to the common room. Turnus simply sorted out and rushed to the principal's office. On the way, 
He also sorted out his thoughts briefly, and went over what he was going to say in his mind to make sure that he would not miss any important information. As the first discoverer of this incident, he was the one who knew the most, so he had to provide as much information as possible to facilitate finding the person behind the scenes. This attack was really strange. Hogwarts had been peaceful for the past year, but someone suddenly attacked Harry at this time. This made people think a lot. The only thing that could be related to this incident was the entrance and exit of King's Cross Station that was closed before the start of school. He also planned to talk about this point, which was the only thing he could connect with this attack. After all, this attack was not a fatal attack, and the last passage closure incident was similar. It seemed that someone was trying to stop Harry from coming to Hogwarts. Of course, it might be a bit hasty to judge the other party's purpose based on these two points, but this was the only purpose he could think of so far. In the first accident, the purpose was very obvious, directly preventing Harry from boarding the Hogwarts Express. As for the second time, if it was just from the worldview of wizards, it might not be obvious. After all, even if he was injured, he could use potions to heal the injured part in a short time. However, if you look at it from the perspective of muggles, the injuries of broken arms and legs must be very serious, and he must be hospitalized. After hospitalization, he will definitely go home to recuperate, and he will not want to go to school in a short time. Moreover, this was the only explanation that Turners could think of. Although it was far-fetched, he didn't know how to explain why the mastermind wanted to hurt Harry but didn't want his life. While thinking about this, Turners had already arrived outside the principal's office. Here, there was a huge stone statue, which was the same type as the one at the door of Turner's exhibition room. They were both magic puppets, generally used to guard some places. When someone wanted to break into the place they were guarding, they would be attacked by them. Turners said the password of the principal's office, and the stone statue in front of him slowly slid to the side, revealing a spiral staircase embedded in the wall. He strode into the spiral staircase, and the side of the staircase began to move by itself, rotating and rising. And the puppet stone statue behind him also returned to its original place and continued to perform its duties. When Turners came to the office, there were already quite a few people standing here. At this time, the professors did not care about etiquette, and stood in front of Dumbledore's desk one by one. It was obvious that they had just had a discussion, but it seemed that there was no result. When they saw Turner's, everyone looked at him, wanting to see Turner's. I think everyone had great doubts in their hearts at this time. Even Dumbledore did not find a small magic, but Turner's actually found it. Such a thing was incredible no matter how you think about it, and everyone was very confused. Of course, no one would doubt that this was done by Turner's, after all, the means were too despicable. If this was really Turner's work, then they could only say that they had overestimated Turner's before. However, they thought it was not, but this also required evidence, otherwise they would not easily believe a person. Even if this person was their student, there would always be people who would be lucky and think that they could trick others. Therefore, even if there was a little suspicion, they had to eliminate it first, and it was impossible to locate a person according to their own senses. The people present could be said to be Dumbledore's confidants. Not only did they have strong strength, but they were also loyal members of the Order of the Phoenix, Dumbledore's supporters, and of course, the most solid force against Voldemort. If Dumbledore wanted to ask anything, he would speak directly, and he didn't care about any information leaks. Turners, you are here, have you found anything about this incident? The person who tampered with the bludger, have you found it? Dumbledore asked straight to the point. No one else present spoke. Although they had some doubts, at least they would not interrupt before Dumbledore finished asking his questions. Principal Dumbledore, there are many problems with this matter. When I investigated before, the game ended when I reached the last position, causing the opponent to interrupt the release of magic in advance. Although I found the last position of the opponent, I did not find the opponent's figure. So what did you find? Who is the opponent? Do you have any clues? Dumbledore asked. Although he had checked the bludger before, there was not much useful information. There was only a very strange magical aura that did not seem to be human, and he did not know what was going on. Although he was a little suspicious, he still wanted to listen to Turner's analysis first. 
Well, then I will tell you some of my opinions. This time the opponent is obviously not a human wizard. As for the reason, I found traces of apparition where the opponent stayed before. I think such magic should not be performed by humans in Hogwarts. To confirm his statement, Turners looked at Dumbledore. Dumbledore nodded in agreement. In the entire Hogwarts territory, except for him as the headmaster, who has some special privileges, no one else can use teleportation magic here. Of course, except for some special magical creatures of their own race, their magic is obviously not restricted by the magic barrier against humans, so there are still some creatures in Hogwarts that can use teleportation magic. I can basically confirm this point. If the professors have any questions, they can go to the Quidditch field by themselves. There should still be some traces left in the player's lounge there. Well, I will check this out later. Mr. Turners, do you have any other clues? Dumbledore agreed with Turner's analysis. This was easy to find out and there was no need to lie. However, he would go back to check it out later. It was not that he did not trust Turner's, but he might be able to find some other clues there. Also, do you professors remember that at the beginning of the school year, the passage to King's Cross Station was blocked, which prevented Harry and his friends from taking the Hogwarts Express? Of course, hasn't the Ministry of Magic explained this? It was an accident, and they have sent people to repair it. Is there any problem? Snape said calmly. There was no expression in his tone, and people could not see any thoughts in his heart. Turners didn't care about Snape's performance. He was already used to Snape like this. Regarding this point, I think the occurrence of these two things is not a simple coincidence. I think all the professors should have checked that the magic on the bludger is not very powerful. This may be partly to avoid exposure. But if you change your mind, does this mean that the other party does not want to kill Harry, but just want to seriously injure Harry? So, what is the purpose of the other party doing this? It was Snape's unique voice again. It can be seen that he still cares about Harry very much, but he didn't show it too obviously. Obviously, he is also very conflicted. From what happened before the start of the school term, it can be seen that the other party obviously wants to stop Harry from coming to school. Let's assume that if Harry is seriously injured in this game, is it possible that Harry will have to leave school and go home to recuperate for this reason? Turners said all his guesses. Then, he looked at other professors to see their opinions. After all, this is just a guess. Whether it is true or not needs to be verified. However, it is obvious that the possibility is actually very low. You know, the magic world is not short of miracles. Maybe in the muggle world, if you are seriously injured, you can only recuperate for a period of time, but in the magic world, perhaps only a dose of magic potion is needed to recover from the serious injury. Of course, some special injuries are excluded, and if you are really seriously injured and dying, it is possible that you cannot be cured immediately and need to rest. These are all possible, depending on what they think. Although this possibility exists, it is too far-fetched. I think it should be just a coincidence. Professor McGonagall on the side was still a little uncertain. After all, this was indeed a little far-fetched. There was always something wrong with the relationship that was forced together. No, I think Mr. Turner's analysis still makes some sense. Don't forget, there are still some dangers in the school now. The Chamber of Secrets has been reopened. The existence in the Chamber of Secrets is dangerous, so this is not impossible. Dumbledore suddenly spoke up to support Turner's point of view. Turner's was also a little surprised about this. In his opinion, just like Professor McGonagall said, his guess was indeed a little far-fetched. If you really count it, it can only be regarded as a forced explanation without sufficient reason. Since we don't know, why don't we ask Mr. Potter here to ask? Maybe he knows something. At that time, Snape, who was poker-faced, suddenly suggested. This proposal made everyone present brighten up. Yes, they have been speculating here for so long, but they have forgotten that the protagonist of this matter is not here. As the person involved, he may know something. Well, Mr. Turners, do you have any other discoveries? If not, you can go back and help me find Harry and ask him to come to my place. Dumbledore asked at the end. Turners shook his head and said, I have no other discoveries. Then I will leave first, professors. Well, when Turners returned to the Gryffindor lounge, there was still a carnival going on here. Everyone was very excited. 
they finally defeated Slytherin College this year. Maybe, this year, they will win the College Cup for Gryffindor. Ronald on the side also released the magic prop that Turner's made that can be projected. A majestic lion, wearing the Gryffindor logo, kept circling around everyone. When Turnus came back, Hermione was the first to notice it. She immediately came to Turnus and asked loudly in the noisy crowd, Turnus, how is it, have the professors found anything, has the magician been caught? She had to speak loudly, after all, the environment here was too noisy, and if she spoke softly, she couldn't hear the other person's voice at all. Turnus leaned close to Hermione's ear and said, not yet, but I came to find Harry. Professor Snape wants to ask Harry if he knows something. I'm going to find him first, otherwise the professors will be anxious. After Turnus said that, he squeezed into the crowd without looking back. He didn't notice that Hermione couldn't help blushing when he spoke to her ear. In the end, even her ears were red like blood. Facing Turnus's intimacy, Hermione was a little overwhelmed, but for some reason, she didn't hate this feeling very much, but instead had a faint sense of expectation. Of course, these were all Hermione's own thoughts, and naturally she couldn't say them out loud. Even if she thought about it in her heart, she was too shy. Soon, Turnus squeezed into the crowd and pulled Harry, who was reveling, out of the crowd. After pulling Harry directly out of the Gryffindor break, he said, Harry, Professor Dumbledore wants to see you for some information. You should go there now. The password to the principal's office is Sherry Sugar. Harry was a little confused. He didn't know what the principal wanted to see him about. His face was flushed with excitement, and it also subsided a little at this time. After listening to Turnus' words, he didn't think much about it. After agreeing, he went to the principal's office. Turnus looked at Harry's back and always had a feeling that no matter which world they were in, as long as they were the protagonists, they would always have all kinds of troubles. Now as a friend of Harry, the protagonist, he could already foresee that there would be constant troubles in the future. However, it is precisely because of such troubles that challenges can continue. This kind of life is interesting. With a sigh, Turnus crawled into the Gryffindor lounge again. After entering the lounge, he joined everyone's carnival. After all, even in his previous life, Turnus was just a young man who had just graduated from college. He had not experienced the beatings of society and was not old enough. It was good to indulge from time to time to maintain a good mental state. Feeling the joy in the hearts of the Gryffindor students, Turnus also felt very happy and relaxed. After this carnival, everyone temporarily forgot the troubles they had encountered in the past few days. But it was obvious that some people did not want them to be so happy. On the second day, a message was spreading throughout the college. The monster in the secret room appeared again. This time the person attacked was Colin, a muggle-born wizard and a loyal fan of Harry, who often took photos of Harry. He always carries a camera with him, and this time, it was because of the camera that he escaped. Although the camera was destroyed, at least he was only petrified and not in danger of life. After experiencing another attack by the monster in the Chamber of Secrets, especially this time the target of the attack was a student. The atmosphere in the college suddenly became tense, and everyone began to worry whether they would be the next person to be attacked especially those muggle-born wizards, who were even more worried all day long. Fortunately, the school responded very quickly and immediately began to organize students and set some rules. For example, when traveling, at least three people are required to act together, and they cannot act alone. In addition, the seniors spontaneously organized patrol teams to patrol the entire Hogwarts castle to prevent accidents from happening again. Of course, Dumbledore, who knew what kind of monster was in the Chamber of Secrets, obviously would not put all his hopes on the student patrol team. After all, their strength was limited, and at most they could only stop the air of the Chamber of Secrets from opening the Chamber of Secrets. As for wanting to use their power to fight against the Basilisk, this is simply a dream and unrealistic. The best solution is to find the secret room and directly get rid of the Basilisk inside. Then, even if the heir of the secret room wants to continue to make trouble, he will have no tools. If it is just one person, it is still easy to deal with, at least much better than a thousand-year-old basilisk. But, unfortunately, this is still an impossible thing. 
Until now, they have not found the entrance to the secret room, so how can they solve the basilisk? Just when Dumbledore and other professors were helpless, a message spread throughout Hogwarts. And with this news, there is also a very special magic prop. This is a thing similar to glasses, but its function is not to correct vision, but to avoid looking directly at things outside through the refraction principle of the mirror. Needless to say, this thing is naturally a magic prop that Turner's, who knows the inside story, has made after these days of research to avoid facing the death gaze of the basilisk directly. Although he still couldn't avoid being petrified in the end, at least he could avoid being killed by the basilisk's eyes. And that news, of course, was about the speculation about the monster in the secret room. Of course, Turner's did not directly expose that the monster inside was a basilisk, but said that it was a magical creature or prop that could petrify by indirect gaze. Since indirect gaze can have such an effect, it goes without saying that the consequences of direct gaze will definitely be more serious. Rather than being troubled by more serious consequences, it is better to be petrified directly. After all, petrification can still be touched, but who knows what the more serious consequences are. Through this rumor, Turner's magic props can be said to have made a lot of money. In just half a day, Turner's successfully sold it to everyone in the entire college, and thus obtained more than 10,000 gold galleons. Although there was some intention to make money from the school, the professors of the school did not stop it, because they also knew that Turner's did this for the good of everyone. After all, they knew the horror of the basilisk in the secret room. Now, if Turner's continues to promote it, it will cause some panic and cause some students to have psychological problems. However, at least they can make every student safe by doing this, and they will not cause the basilisk to kill people directly due to negligence. In general, Dumbledore still supports this matter. Although Turner's also made a lot of money, compared with the lives of students, everything is worth it. Turner's family is not a charity, and they can't let the people who found a temporary solution for everyone get nothing and lose money. However, after Turner's is commotion, the students of the whole school are temporarily safe. Next, they need to consider how to solve the problem of the secret room. As long as it exists for one day, it will eventually be a hidden danger. Time passed in such a slightly tense atmosphere. In the last week of Christmas, the school suddenly announced a news. With Lockhart taking the lead, Wang Lihao, and Snape assisting, a fighting club was established together. The purpose of the club is to enable all students to learn certain magic combat skills and improve their combat effectiveness in the face of possible dangers. You are not required to help the school catch the air of Slytherin, but at least you must be able to protect yourself. It was for this purpose that Dumbledore agreed to Lockhart's proposal. Of course, he seemed to be able to see that Lockhart was just an embroidered pillow, so he sent Snape, the most powerful person in the academy besides him, to assist the school. Let's not talk about the final result. At least, after this news came out, Lockhart, who had been low-key, for a few days, started to jump again. Although Sheeness directly exposed his true face at the beginning of the semester. However, the impact of this incident was too small, or maybe Lockhart was just good at pretending. So many of his fans still didn't believe what happened in the defense against the dark arts class in the second year of Gryffindor and Slytherin. Coupled with his subsequent remedial work, he successfully suppressed the impact of this incident. However, Hermione and others have seen Lockhart's true face and no longer worship him. This is also good news. As for whether others still worship Lockhart, Turner's can't control it. As for the situation of the club, Turner's didn't even think about going. If he had the spare time, he might as well stay in the dormitory and make some adobe bricks to prepare for the work during the Christmas holiday. After this period of preparation, Turner's has prepared more than 30,000 adobe bricks. Although it is far from enough to complete the decoration of the entire dragon cave, it is enough to repair only a part. As long as this part of 640 is decorated, they can put Nobo in. That way, he wouldn't have to worry about Norbo destroying his place. When Turnus was preparing the materials, time passed quickly. When he opened his eyes again, he saw Hermione walking in angrily from the door. Seeing her appearance, she was obviously a little angry, so Turnus naturally wanted to show his concern. Hermione, what's wrong with you? Did someone bully you? Tell me, I'll help you get revenge. 
Looking at Turnus' serious expression, Hermione didn't doubt Turnus' words at all. After all, he was the man who took his wand and taught Draco a lesson when his brother was bullied in the first grade. Hermione quickly calmed down and said a little depressed. No one bullied me, I just feel a little pity. From Quirrell in the first grade to Lockhart in the second grade, why don't we have a reliable teacher for the defense against the dark arts? Okay Hermione, don't worry about it. We are only in the second grade, CJCC, now. Don't be too impatient. Anyway, the magic power of young wizards of this age is not enough to cast higher level magic. Even if we find a reliable teacher now, we won't learn much. Of course, I think that in the third year, Professor Dumbledore will definitely find us a qualified defense against the dark arts professor, and then you will be able to learn a lot of knowledge. Although this is just a comforting word, he is also telling the truth. The lower grade students really can't learn anything in the past two years. But it may be a pity for those middle grade wizards. They are in the grade that needs a lot of knowledge, and this grade doesn't need to care about public exams such as wizard exams. It is the time with the most abundant time. During this period, they have a lot of time to study. After this grade, they will soon face the fifth year ordinary wizard level examination. At that time, a large part of their energy will need to be invested in this. In this case, even if there are good teachers, the time they can study is ultimately limited, it is already very good to be able to complete their studies normally. There is no time at all to carry out some extracurricular extended learning. This is the most hurtful thing for them. Of course, what is said here is only for those wizards of muggle origin. If they are children from wizard families, they will definitely get some guidance from their parents during the summer vacation. This is understandable. Sometimes, your origin actually determines the amount of resources you have. It doesn't mean that if you work hard, you will definitely get a lot of rewards. Many times, your efforts are not proportional to your rewards. That's all I can do. I hope that by then, there will be a more reliable professor, and no more of these messy things. Hermione responded weakly, but she didn't seem very interested. Turnus couldn't help but laugh when he heard Hermione's words. It was enough to show that Hermione was really annoyed by these two teachers. Otherwise, with Hermione's personality, it would be impossible for her to say such serious words. Hermione, who was sitting on a chair beside him, heard Turnus's laughter and knew that she had just said something wrong. Her face turned slightly red and she felt a little embarrassed. Looking at the cute Hermione, Turnus changed the subject, by the way, what did you learn just now? Show me. Okay. Hermione suddenly became energetic and got rid of the embarrassment just now. We just learned a spell from Professor Snape, the disarming spell. Hermione was still very serious when she talked about the spell. Hermione's face became serious and she began to explain it to Turnus. Turnus nodded after listening to Hermione's explanation. He still believed in Snape's teaching level. And Snape's strength was also very strong. The disarming spell he taught everyone in this club activity was indeed a spell of moderate difficulty and very strong effect. How about it? I saw Professor Snape use this spell there before. It actually knocked Lockhart's wand away in one go, and the remaining magic power also knocked Lockhart away directly. Hermione obviously admires this spell. However, with their current control over magic power, if they want to learn this spell and successfully perform it, they still need to practice it. It is impossible to learn it in such a short time. Indeed, this spell is very practical. Even in the battles between adult wizards, it is often used. It can not only knock away the wands in other people's hands, but also continuously output magic power, and be used as a continuous magic. Quote. But Hermione, you need to remember that this spell only disarms the things in the opponent's hands, and will not affect other weapons on the body. Turnus warned very seriously. This issue is very important, because in future battles, a careless mistake may cause unnecessary casualties. These details are sometimes the key to winning or losing. Hermione was very smart and quickly understood what Turnus meant. You mean, as long as you carry a wand with you, as long as you are in battle and the opponent's disarming spell knocks away your spell, you can completely draw out the spell on your body and continue fighting when you relax. Turnus smiled and nodded to approve Hermione's idea, but he added, it's not just you who can think of it, many people can think of it, but most people usually only prepare one wand, so this method is generally not used. 
However, it is not ruled out that some dark wizards who fight all year round may use such means, and the possibility that they have multiple wands on them will be higher. Hermione immediately began to ask, why is this? Why do these dark wizards who fight all year round have multiple wands in their hands? This involves the wand itself. I think when you bought the wand, Ollivander must have asked you to try different wands. Turnus did not answer this question immediately, but asked back. Hermione nodded and said thoughtfully, Yes, I also tried several wands at that time, and finally chose this one, Vine Wood, Dragon Heart, 14 inches K. I think you should have heard of Ollivander's famous saying, it is the wand that chooses the wizard, not the wizard who chooses the wand. Yes, 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 he also said that to me, is there any problem with this sentence? Hermione responded actively, but at the same time, she also had some doubts, not knowing what Turner's was going to say. Turner's did not speak immediately, but took out his pine wand, waved it twice and handed it to Hermione, you try it and see if it feels different from holding a wand. Hermione was a little confused and reached out to take Turner's pine wand. She didn't know what Turner's wanted to say, but she still waved it twice in her hand according to Turner's words. At the beginning, it was nothing. There was no big difference from her usual use of the wand. This made Hermione very confused, but gradually, as she waved it for a longer time and felt more carefully, she found that the wand in her hand seemed to have some differences. She could clearly feel that the wand in her hand seemed to be delayed in some places when releasing magic power, and she didn't know why. Although such delay is very subtle, it can't be felt at all if you don't feel it carefully. However, such delay will produce a series of chain effects at certain times, resulting in her ability not being able to fully exert at certain critical moments. At this time, Hermione already understood what Turner's wanted to say. Turners, you mean, when a wand does not recognize a wizard, it will have some resistance, causing the wizard's magic power to sluggish, affecting a person's strength, right? Hermione seemed to have grasped the key to something. But she felt that she had not, and this feeling made her very irritated. You haven't grasped the key to the problem. Indeed, such a phenomenon often happens, but this is not what I want to say. What I want to say is that when a person uses magic to defeat another person, then this person will become the winner. Turners took the wand from Hermione and waved it in his hand. His magic passed through the wand and formed a simple picture in the air. In the picture, there are two wizards holding wands. They stand face to face, as if they are dueling. Turners continued, when a wizard defeats another wizard, it proves that this wizard is stronger than the other. Quote. As Turners explained, the picture in front of him changed. A wizard hit another person with a magic wand, and the person fell to the ground, while the winner gradually rose. He continued, the winner is stronger than the loser, and generally speaking, no matter what it is, as long as he has his own emotions, even if it is just a little bit, he will instinctively submit to the strong. And the magic wand happens to be such an item. Although Hermione was doubtful, she already had the answer in her heart. Yes, most wands have this characteristic, and the most obvious one is the old wand, one of the three legendary holy artifacts. It has been passed down from a long time ago, and there has always been only one way to change the owner, that is, the current owner defeats the previous owner. After hearing Turnus' words, Hermione looked at him in amazement, stood up and threw herself on him, holding Turnus' collar tightly with both hands, and asked in disbelief, what did you say? The legend of the three deathly holy artifacts is actually true, no way, this is impossible. Turnus looked at Hermione who was so excited that she had lost her composure, gently soothed her emotions, and whispered, why can't it be true, they exist. What? Have you seen it? Where? Hermione immediately became excited. She didn't have any greedy ideas about the three deathly holy artifacts, but just because she was a little curious about what the legendary holy artifacts were like. It's Harry's invisibility cloak. It's one of the three holy artifacts. As for the Elder Wand, you are also familiar with its current owner. He is our headmaster, Albus Dumbledore. Turnus knew about this matter. Because this is no longer a secret in the top society. As long as they are powerful wizards, they are connected. Especially for pure blood families like Longbottom, for them, there are not many secrets in this world that they can't find. At this time, Hermione has not noticed that she is still lying on Turnus. 
and Ternus will not remind Hermione that such a good opportunity to cultivate intimacy, how could he destroy it? It was not until a long time later that Hermione digested this huge amount of information and came back to her senses from her absent-mindedness. It was not until this time that she realized that her internus seemed to be a little too intimate. Hermione quickly got up, blushing with embarrassment, and didn't dare to look at Turner's. Turner's didn't tease Hermione, okay Hermione, let me continue to practice the disarming spell now, let me see how good you are at the disarming spell now. Actually, what level is there? Hermione has just started to learn this magic, and it's hard to perform it successfully, let alone other things. All Turners can do is to be a human target to set an attack target for Hermione. Hermione and Turners used his dormitory as a practice place and started practicing spells here. At the beginning, Hermione was indeed unable to successfully release this magic, and at most she could only form a beam of magic to form some insignificant impact force. It should be said that Hermione is worthy of it. 4, 4, 7, after a period of practice, Hermione has been very fast, improving her control of the disarming spell. Such a speed of improvement can be said to be very fast, even Turner's was secretly amazed. In the end, Hermione finally successfully released the magic and knocked Turnus's wand away. Seeing Turnus's wand fall out of his hand, Hermione immediately jumped up excitedly and jumped into Turnus's arms, obviously very happy. Seeing Hermione's true feelings, Ness also became happy. Turnus, thank you so much for helping me practice this magic. Hermione said excitedly while hugging Turnus. No need to thank me, we are good friends. Turnus gently patted Hermione's shoulder to calm her excitement. In the following time, Hermione was familiar with the release process of this magic, and at the same time felt what kind of performance this magic would have under different magic output. Time passed quickly as the two of them practiced magic. In the next few days, everyone could notice that the relationship between Turnus and Hermione became closer. Although they were not yet at the level of boyfriend and girlfriend, they had already exceeded the scope of normal good friends. Hermione was obviously aware of this, but she didn't care. On the contrary, she was still very happy. She liked the current mode of getting along, which made her very happy. Time passed quickly. After they had their last dinner, the students who went home for Christmas all carried their luggage and boarded the train home. Those who didn't go home were busy with their own things. Since the last attack by Colin, nothing had happened for a long time. Everyone was still relaxed and would not have any bad effects due to excessive tension. Everyone was doing their own things. This Christmas, there were not many students staying in school, and there would not be too many people staying outside. It snowed again recently, and the weather turned a little cold. At this time, there was no place warmer and more comfortable than the common room of each college. Of course, there were still some people who had to go out to do things. Turners and others were obviously this kind of people. Who asked them to help Nobo find a new home. In order to complete this task as soon as possible, they could only move forward on the thick snow. Turners, what materials have you prepared? Are they enough to make a small place for Nobo? Draco was still a little worried, worried that Turners didn't prepare enough materials, and the place made for Nobo was not big enough, which was wronged by his sweetheart. Turners rolled his eyes helplessly. He was doing hard labor for free. You still have so many requirements. He was too lazy to pay attention to Draco, and walked forward without saying a word. Looking at Turners who didn't pay attention to him at all, Draco was bored and didn't say anything more. He followed Turner's and others honestly and walked towards Hagrid's hut. When they arrived here, Hagrid had been waiting outside early. He had been looking forward to this day for a long time, and now he finally waited for Turner's and them, naturally very happy. Hagrid came up with a smile, brushed the snow off Turn's body, and said excitedly, You are finally here, let's start now, Nobo can't wait, you don't know how happy he was when I told him the news today. Turnus rolled his eyes and said speechlessly, yes, I noticed it too. Turnus looked at Hagrid's clothes that were burned by the dragon's breath. Hagrid scratched his head honestly and defended his dragon son. Nobo was too happy, so he couldn't control himself and some fire came out of his nose, but he already knew he was wrong and is now staying in the suitcase honestly. Quote. Khan J. Hagrid na long nu de yang zi te na si gen de bu ji dao gai shuo xian mi la ideographic period.
Ren Jia Zui Duo Yi Ju Shi Tian Yi Tian Nu Ren, Ni Dao Hao, Tian Chi Le Huo Long Lai, Ta Men Nao Chi Shao Pai Chi Lai, Ke Bu Shi Nao J Wan De Ideographic Period. Bu Guo, Zai Te Na Si De Mian Qian, Nuo Bo Dao Yi Ji Do Fei Chong De Guai Chao Ideographic Period. Bu Shi Yin Wei Bie De, Er Shi Dan Chun De Bei Zou Pa Le Ideographic Period. Te Na Si Ke Kong Lai Bu Wei Guan Jie Ta De, Ji Yao Yi Yu Bu Dui, Ju Ji Ji A Sheng Shou Chou Ta, Ju Suan Shi Hagrid couldn't stop him. As for whether he has the strength, let's not talk about it, sometimes we don't really see it. Of course, this is also due to a very powerful magic prop in his hand. No, it can't be called a magic prop, but it should be called an imperial weapon, which is also the name of that world. This is a silk-like imperial weapon, named the Thousand Change Cross Tail 4.5. This imperial weapon is a magic prop formed entirely of silk threads. Each silk thread is very tough and basically difficult to tear apart. Moreover, they are not only tough, but also have a very powerful cutting effect. Under the control of Turnus, they can even decompose a large tree as thick as a bull into pieces in an instant. It is precisely because of such an imperial weapon that Turnus can inhumanely whip Nobo, who has not yet reached adulthood. As long as Nobo is not honest, he will directly use the cross tail to restrain Nobo and make him lose his ability to move. Then the next thing is not up to him, and a whip is definitely indispensable. From childhood to adulthood, Nobo has been taught a lot by Turnus. This is why Norbo has not dared to get close to Turnus until now, because once he was too excited and could not control the dragon breath in his body and sprayed it out, he would be beaten by Turnus. In order to suffer less, he was very tactful and stayed away from Turnus. Okay, since I'm here, let's start directly. I'll finish it early and rest early. Turnus said helplessly. After hearing Turnus' words, Hagrid was very happy. He immediately took off Turnus' coat and hung it on the hook beside him. After watching Turnus enter the dragon cave, he also hurriedly followed Norbo's box and followed. As for the others, they also took off their clothes and slowly followed into the dragon cave. Inside the dragon cave, the temperature is not as low as outside. After all, the source of magic here is a magic crystal with fire attribute. The magic emitted will naturally carry a lot of fire attribute energy. The temperature here is unlikely to be lower. However, this kind of environment is unexpectedly suitable for the growth of Norwegian Ridgeback Dragon Nobo. After all, it is a fire dragon. Looking at the spacious environment around him, Turnus felt very satisfied. Of course, while he was satisfied, he also felt a headache. The space here was too big. In such a large space, if you want to decorate it completely, the manpower and material resources required are beyond the imagination of ordinary people. Okay, everyone, get ready to work. As he said, Turnus took out five dragon skin bags from his clothes behind him. These bags are used to hold decoration materials, which are all earth bricks refined by Turnus these days. Harry and the others don't have that level of magic, so they can't do more things, but they can at least help carry the materials. As for the rest of the work, it needs to be handed over to Turnus. Even Hermione can only help in such work. As the earth bricks were taken out one by one, Turnus controlled them, and they floated up one by one and went to their predetermined positions. By the way, it also leaves the necessary space for what is to be done later. Turnus started decorating from the central stone pillar. This will be the key part of this dragon cave in the future, and it is also the center of all magic sources, so it cannot be sloppy. Moreover, when the fire dragon replenishes the magic here in the future, it will also need to be executed through it. If there is a problem here, the entire dragon cave space will collapse. First of all, it is natural to lay a layer of earth bricks here in the surrounding area to make a foundation and stabilize the ground. After laying all the earth bricks, Turnus used a special adhesive to bond all the earth bricks together to make them a whole, so that the foundation will not be unstable due to some movement. Then he took out a large amount of red copper ore from the space, and used the transformation technique to lay them on the stone pillars and the surrounding ground. This layer is half a meter thick. Just this layer of materials would cost at least 50,000 gold coins. If he hadn't made a large-scale sacrifice during this period to fill the space with materials, he would have been reluctant to do so. 
Use red gold to connect this layer of red copper ore with the innermost flame crystal, so that the magic between them forms a circuit. Then, he began to engrave magic inscriptions on this layer of red copper ore. The main thing is the fire resistance inscription. Although this red copper ore also has a very high fire resistance, its own fire attribute is also very good. It is a very good fire attribute material. Such materials should be able to withstand the dragon's breath of the fire dragon. But it's better to be safe than sorry. Therefore, what should be done should be done. Don't think of ways to change it when the time comes. By that time, it will be a bit late. It's better to do it now, so that you don't have to worry about problems here in the future. In addition to the fire resistance inscriptions, there are also absorption inscriptions. This part is the key. They are the key to collecting the magic power in the fire dragon river. Only when they exist can the flame crystal be replenished with energy and the operation of the entire dragon cave space be supported. Of course, other types of flames are also possible, but how much magic energy can be provided to that magic crystal is still an unknown number and needs to be seen at that time. After completing the surrounding arrangements, Turnus finally breathed a sigh of relief. It was only at this time that he had time to rest. Now it has been more than five hours since he came here. That is, his physical fitness is strong and his magic limit is high enough. Otherwise, he really can't bear such consumption. When Turnus stopped, Hermione hurried forward and helped Turnus move a stool for him to sit down. Then there was water and food, very delicious orange juice, and a large piece of pumpkin pie. Turnus took the food, stuffed two mouthfuls into his mouth, and drank two sips of orange juice, then he breathed a sigh of relief. I'm really tired. I don't have much magic power left. I really need to take a good rest. Turnus finally had the energy to speak until this time. You don't have to worry. Anyway, the next vacation is still long, so there's no need to rush. Hermione was on the side, rubbing Turnus' arm holding the wand, and gently persuaded him. It won't happen later. Turnus did not live up to Hermione's kindness. His previous work was also because he had to do it in one step, otherwise it would be easy to make mistakes. Otherwise, he would not have worked so hard for Nobo. The work will be much easier in the future. You just need to reinforce the entire space. When the time comes, you can help me. Turnus said with a smile and at the same time leaned back on the chair with great enjoyment. Looking at Turnus in such a posture, Hermione didn't care and continued to help him relax his arms. At this time, Harry and his friends also came here. They had just come back from putting materials there. They were not very tired, and they did not do anything. Looking at these two people, Draco smiled maliciously and said jokingly, What are you doing? Do you want to do something that adults do here? Do we need to avoid it? Looking at Draco who deserved to be beaten, Harry and others quietly moved away from him. Hagrid looked at Draco like this and opened his mouth but didn't say anything. However, he also saw the actions of Harry and the others, and wisely stayed away from Draco like Harry and the others. Although Hermione was a little shy and her face was already red, she didn't stop her actions because of shyness when she thought of Turnus's workload before. Her face was just red, which was very cute. Turnus was very angry at this time and glared at Draco fiercely. This guy had no eyesight at all and deserved his bad luck. Without seeing any movement from him, Draco's body soared into the sky uncontrollably and was suspended upside down in the air. Draco was mentally broken by this sudden attack, and he shouted very rudely, asking everyone to save him. But at this time, who would offend Turnus? At this time, Draco's life or death was at stake so everyone sat aside quietly, eating and drinking water to replenish their consumption. Seeing this, Hermione knew that it was Turnus who took action. While helping Turnus relax, she looked at Draco above her head. At the same time, one hand was free, and a silencing spell was released while waving the wand. Equals. Plus, hash. The dragon cave, which was originally a little noisy, was now silent, with only the sound of people eating. Watching the fierce operations of the two people beside them, Harry and the others lowered their heads one by one, not daring to make a sound, even the sound of eating was suppressed very low. Fearing that Turnus would retaliate. But just sitting here was also boring, and Harry couldn't help but start looking for topics. And recently, what is more attractive than the Chamber of Secrets? Naturally, Harry spoke up, 
Turners, Professor Dumbledore has not yet figured out a way to deal with the monster in the Chamber of Secrets. Do you think Hogwarts will really be closed in the end? Hearing Harry's question, Turners didn't care. He knew that Hogwarts would definitely not be disbanded. Even if the Basilisk made a big noise, at most classes would be suspended for a period of time. As for closing Hogwarts completely, that was simply impossible. It's impossible. Hogwarts will not be disbanded. Turners answered very confidently. Although he didn't know the specific reason, seeing Turners's affirmation, Harry breathed a sigh of relief. Hogwarts was his favorite place now. If such a place was closed, he really didn't know where to go. Hagrid on the side seemed to know something, but after hesitating for a while, he didn't say what he wanted to say, as if he had some reservations. Turnus felt that Draco had been punished enough, so he stopped hanging him and let him down. As for his silencing spell, it had been removed when everyone was eating. Draco was still a little uncomfortable when he first came down. He lay on the ground for a while before finally standing up, shaking his dizzy head, slowly walked to the others, picked up a piece of food and started eating. Draco was not someone who could sit idle. While eating, he said proudly, my father told me that the Chamber of Secrets was opened 50 years ago, and a muggle died because of it. As Draco spoke, everyone's attention was attracted by him, and they obviously wanted to see if Draco could tell them some other news. At this time, Harry and the others did not doubt that Draco was the heir of the Chamber of Secrets. After all, they had been busy with the Dragon Cave these days, getting up early and going to bed late every day, so how could they have the energy to do this? Besides, they had been together for a long time. If Draco had any abnormality, he would definitely reveal some clues, and they could not have no idea. Harry was still very concerned about the Chamber of Secrets, and immediately asked Draco, Draco, did your father tell us who was the person who opened the Chamber of Secrets back then? Listening to Harry's question and looking at his anxious look, Draco's tail unconsciously began to rise again. He looked at Harry very proudly and said in a flamboyant tone, Scarhead, do you think I will tell you? Although his tone was very arrogant, there was a trace of embarrassment in the depths of his eyes, because he would never say it out, he himself didn't know, this was a very hard-earned pretense, how could it be easily seen through? Turnus glanced at Draco, curled his lips and said disdainfully, you don't know. Draco immediately exploded and shouted loudly, how is it possible, how could I not know? Although he pretended to be very angry, the guilty conscience in his eyes exposed his true colors. This time, with such an obvious performance, Harry and the others obviously saw something, and they all sighed, thinking that they could know some inside information, but they didn't expect that it was just a rookie who only knew a little bit. Looking at the regretful expressions of Harry and others, Draco couldn't pretend any more at this time. After all, he really didn't know any useful information. Turnus on the side suddenly thought of something and looked at Hagrid on the side. At this time, Hagrid was still grateful that Draco didn't know the inside story of what happened that year promised. Looking at Hagrid's expression, Turnus was a little strange, not knowing why he had such an expression. But he didn't think much about it, but asked Hagrid. Hagrid, according to your age, you should have been studying at Hogwarts, do you know anything? After hearing what Turnus asked Hagrid, the others realized that it was true. There was indeed someone around them who might have been a student back then, so he should know something. They couldn't help but look at Hagrid, wanting to get some answers from him. But Hagrid, who was just feeling lucky, was suddenly asked, and panicked for a moment, anxiously defending, it wasn't me, it really wasn't me who opened the Chamber of Secrets back then, I didn't hurt anyone, and Aragog wouldn't have done that, he was so sinful. Faced with Hagrid's sudden self-explosion, no one was able to react. When they reacted, they all looked at Hagrid with disbelief. It was not until he saw everyone's expressions that he realized that he seemed to have let something slip. He quickly covered his mouth in a silly way to hide the fact that he had let something slip. But how could this be covered up? Harry and the others immediately rushed up and surrounded Hagrid and questioned him. At this point, Hagrid knew that he had to confess. With their attitude, they were obviously going to get to the bottom of it. Although he regretted his own thick nerves, why did he let it slip here? If he hadn't said this, he might not have been questioned. Harry and the others would not have known what he had done. Although he didn't think there was anything wrong with what he did at the time. 
In the end, Hagrid still told Turners and the others about his experience that year. It turned out that when the Chamber of Secrets was opened, Hagrid also did a very stupid thing at that time. He secretly raised a giant spider with eight 590 eyes in the castle. It was because of this incident that he was identified as the heir of Slytherin by Tom Riddle, the then student president, and was directly arrested to Azkaban. At the same time, his status as a Hogwarts student was revoked, his wand was broken, and he lost the right to use magic from then on. Although later, he was Dumbledore came out to guarantee, but there was no change to his sentence, because he did do something stupid. In Hogwarts, raising a creature with a dangerous level of XXXXX is an irresponsible act towards the lives of others and oneself. Even if he knew that he was not the opener of the Chamber of Secrets, he could still be sentenced to a certain punishment for the crime he committed. Of course, it would not be as serious as it is now, and he would be directly banned from using magic for life. After listening to Hagrid's story, the people present looked at Hagrid with some fear. Even Turnus, although he was not afraid, suddenly thought of one thing. Digging a huge space like a dragon's lair under Hagrid's house, would it become a breeding ground for all of Hagrid's dangerous creatures in the end? If this is really the case, it would be fine if there is no problem. Once there is a problem, this place will become a place more dangerous than Slytherin's Chamber of Secrets. Thinking of this, Turnus regretted digging such a place. He really didn't know whether this was helping Hagrid is still harming him. This is not Turner's exaggerating, but it is very likely to happen. Hagrid's attitude towards magical creatures is really problematic. He really likes those dangerous magical creatures too much and doesn't think they are dangerous at all. He would not consider what kind of consequences this would bring to him and the surrounding environment. All of this was not within his thinking range. Seeing that Turna's expression suddenly changed, Hermione asked nervously, Turna's, is there something wrong? I think your mood seems to be a little wrong. Hearing Hermione's call, Turna's woke up from his meditation, looked at the concerned eyes of others around him, and saw Hagrid looking at him cautiously as if he had done something wrong. Turna's suddenly felt that Hagrid was not a wicked person. He just couldn't tell which magical creatures could be raised and which could not be raised. As long as he was told all this, he should be able to suppress his preferences. Okay, at least part of it is still okay. Okay, don't worry about me, I just suddenly thought of something just now, it's okay. Turnas reached out and rubbed Hermione's little head gently, making her hair even more messy. This made Hermione a little embarrassed and annoyed, and she patted Turnus as a punishment. I just suddenly thought of a question. Then, Turnus told everyone his worries. The others were all horrified when they heard it. Indeed, based on what they knew about Hagrid's performance, such a thing was indeed something Hagrid could do. Looking at the magical creatures he has now, Fluffy the three-headed dog, and Norbo the Norwegian Ridgeback, Turnus also knows that he has a hippogriff. As for whether there are others, Turnus doesn't know, maybe there are, or maybe not. Hagrid looked at the others awkwardly. He didn't understand why the magical creatures he raised were all very, friendly, and, cute. When they saw Hagrid like this, they knew that Turnus's worries were fulfilled. At this time, they also recalled that Hagrid seemed to be unable to tell how harmful those magical creatures were to ordinary humans. Hagrid has always used his body size as a reference. As long as he feels that there is no harm to him, he does not think there is any problem. However, this itself is problematic. How big is Hagrid? Let's put it this way. His height reaches 4.88 meters. Can a person this tall be the same as a normal person? He is more than twice the normal person, not to mention that he is a horizontally developed person. That tonnage is even more needless to say. There are really not many magical creatures that can threaten him in front of him. In addition, he himself is a half-blood giant, and his body's magic resistance is still sufficient. The magic of those magical creatures can cause him limited damage. Not to mention that such a strong body, the physical strength brought by it, can completely crush some magical creatures that are not good at physical strength. Can such a monster-like existence be compared with ordinary people? Hagrid was really embarrassed by the stares of his friends, and finally asked with a blush, why are you looking at me like that? Hagrid, in your mind, what is the most dangerous magical creature? Turners asked tentatively. 
he wanted to confirm what Hagrid's criteria for judging danger were, so as to facilitate the subsequent conversation. When the others heard Turner's question, they all looked at Hagrid, waiting for his answer. Hagrid's answer did not disappoint them. At least, in terms of judging danger, Hagrid was still a normal person and knew what was dangerous. The most dangerous magical creature. Of course it's the Dementors. They are so scary. Hagrid seemed to think of bad memories. When he mentioned the Dementors, he couldn't help but shudder. Obviously, he was left with a psychological shadow. Turners had also learned about Dementors. They were very scary magical creatures. They feed on human happiness. After encountering the breath of happiness, they will think of humans. Through the mouth, they can directly absorb the happiness emitted by people. Turners didn't know the specific principle, but it was indeed a very scary magical creature. It is said that their kiss can directly suck your soul out of the body. Although this is indeed very dangerous, and everyone who knows it will have a chilling feeling when hearing this name. However, at this time, such an answer undoubtedly proved that Hagrid still had the ability to judge the danger, but he was used to judging the danger of other creatures based on his own standards. Although this was also quite dangerous, at least it could be corrected through persuasion and explanation, at least making him understand that magical creatures that were not very dangerous to him were not necessarily harmless to others. For a long time afterwards, everyone began to explain this danger judgment to Hagrid. Try to make Hagrid put his danger judgment value on the same level as humans, ordinary humans, not humans, like him. Later, Hagrid's situation was really difficult to correct. Turners even asked Harry and the others to put down all the work at hand and only do ideological work for Hagrid, asking him to work hard to correct his thinking logic. Turners had no choice. He was really dry-mouthed and did not see much improvement. So, he simply handed this troublesome matter to them. Anyway, among the people present, except Hermione, the others were not very helpful to his work, so it would be better to let them extinguish a dangerous source that may cause great harm in the future. Just like that, when Turnus and Hermione were busy everywhere in the Dragon Cave. Hagrid was chatting with Harry, Ronald, Neville and Draco. In the next few days, Turnus finally understood that these people were useless here and could only watch him do things. They were not only not good at casting spells, but also bad at controlling magic. They were not helpful at all. Turnus simply ignored them and sent them to Hagrid to do ideological work. Hermione, on the other hand, was only helping in this process, but she was very motivated. In the process of helping, she was also constantly learning by herself, and her learning talent was also very high. In a short period of time, she was able to help Turnus do some things. In order to make himself feel more relaxed, Turnus also deliberately began to teach Hermione spellcasting skills and some special magic. They are all about alchemy. Generally speaking, magicians who are not alchemists basically don't touch them. Before, Hermione naturally had no contact with alchemy. If she wanted to learn it now, it would be a bit late. Turnus only taught some of the magic they would use next. Turnus can continue to teach the rest in the future. It depends on whether Hermione is willing to learn. In the following period of time, Turnus and the others quickly arranged the interior of the entire dragon cave in such an atmosphere. While arranging, Turnus was also thinking about some questions. These questions were left when Hagrid told about his experience in school. But he also knew that even now, if he asked Hagrid, Hagrid would not know too much. The biggest possibility was that he would not know anything. After all, he was obviously blamed for others back then, and there were only so many things he could know. If he knew everything, he would not be Hagrid, and he would not be wronged like that. Being imprisoned in Azkaban is not a good experience. Now Turnus can only wait until school starts to find Dumbledore to see if he has any clues, maybe he can solve some of Turnus's doubts. After Hogwarts started, they had completed the area of more than 20 meters centered on the Dragon Cave's pillar, Central Stone Pillar. This area is not small. You should know that after this circle, the area they have completed has reached more than 1,200 square meters. Zero. Such an area is already very large, which is enough for Noble to live temporarily. In the future, they will continue to expand this area. However, their working ability is limited after all. It will take a long time to pave the entire Dragon Cave. More importantly, 
Turnus has used up very few of the earth bricks he refined. Next, he not only needs to arrange the place, but also refine earth bricks all the time to ensure that there are enough earth bricks for them to use. This part that has been laid is not just a simple layer of laying. It needs to be laid at least three layers thick. After all, the next one living here is a fire dragon, and there may be other terrifying magical creatures in the future. If this guy is restless and destroys the ground, it is very likely to destroy the magic inscription of the traceless stretching spell laid underground. At that time, the entire dragon cave space will be completely destroyed. Not to mention other things, wouldn't their previous efforts be in vain, not to mention that some animals and plants will be transplanted in it next. By then, the manpower and material resources they spent here will not be a small amount. If he destroys it because he didn't think it through, he will be very sad. Although this is just a practice, he doesn't want it to be destroyed by an accident. Three layers of earth bricks are laid underground, which means it will be at least three meters thick. As for the top, it doesn't need to be too troublesome, only one layer is enough. Coupled with the blessing of some magic inscriptions, the hardness here is still very high, and it can withstand the attack of the fire dragon. At that time, as long as Nobo is warned, there should be no problem. With the students returning to school, they only have the opportunity to come here on weekends. They still have a lot of things to do in the rest of the time, and they don't have all the time to waste here. Moreover, Turns also urgently needs to find Dumbledore to learn some of the inside story of the past, and find out the true god before the tragedy happens again. Turns can basically imagine now that if this school is attacked again, it goes without saying that Hagrid, the honest man, will be blamed again. At that time, it is inevitable that a round-trip ticket to Azkaban will be given away for free. So, if such a tragedy can be prevented, it is better to stop it as soon as possible. That night, after dinner, Turns went directly to Dumbledore. Following Dumbledore, Shine came to his office. I wonder what you want to see me for, Turns. Dumbledore asked with some doubts. For Turns' sudden visit, he really couldn't think of any reason. Principal, I want to ask, do you still have any impression of Tom Riddle? Turns went straight to the crux of the matter and asked Dumbledore. When hearing this name, Turns could clearly feel that Dumbledore was completely shocked. It was obvious that this name had a very important meaning, and Dumbledore had always remembered it in his heart. When he heard this name, he immediately had an uncontrollable reaction. Although he quickly concealed it, Turnus still noticed the change in Dumbledore. Principal, you must know this person, right? Can you tell me about him? Turnus asked immediately, not giving Dumbledore a chance to deny it. Dumbledore leaned back and leaned on the back of the chair. He took off his glasses, wiped them gently with the corner of his clothes, and put them back on. Then he said, for this name, where did you know it from? Turnus did not have too many emotions. If there was any, it was a little joy. He knew that Dumbledore had already loosened up and was going to ask the question he asked. It's Hagrid. When we were chatting some time ago, he told us some things that happened in the school 50 years ago. Turner said directly. There is no need to hide anything from Dumbledore. There is nothing shameful about it. So that's how it is. The school did treat him unfairly in that incident. In order for the school to continue to operate, I can only make the best of a bad situation and let Hagrid take the responsibility. Dumbledore said apologetically. He knew that Hagrid didn't do it, but if he didn't handle it that way, the entire Hogwarts might be forced to close. He absolutely couldn't accept such a consequence. In fact, you don't have to be sad, Headmaster. Hagrid did do something wrong back then. Although he didn't open the Chamber of Secrets, he also kept an eight-eyed giant spider in Hogwarts. It was a magical creature of the XXXXX level announced by the Ministry of Magic. It was extremely dangerous. He also redeemed himself for his actions. Turnus didn't comfort Dumbledore. This was the fact. Hagrid was wrong and there was nothing to hide. Besides, the punishment he received was already severe enough. Is that so? So that's why Hagrid didn't want to say it. What kind of magical creature did he keep privately at that time? Although Dumbledore had some guesses, he still didn't delve into such things. It was not until now that he knew what kind of magical creature caused the situation at that time. Then Professor, can you tell me about Tom Riddle now? Turners brought the topic back on track and asked Dumbledore to continue. 
Dumbledore fell into deep thought and slowly said, he is a very talented wizard. I was the one who picked him up when he enrolled. Sometimes, I regret my action at that time. If I hadn't been there at that time, maybe the whole world would be much more peaceful. Hearing this, Turner's had some guesses in his heart. There are only a few people who can influence the world. If there is a person who makes the whole world unpeaceful, it can only be that person. However, he did not interrupt Dumbledore's statement, but listened quietly there. He is an orphan. I first met him in the orphanage. When the Chamber of Secrets incident happened, he was the president of the Student Union of Hogwarts, a person with outstanding talent and clever means. Quote. Back then, in order to save Hogwarts, he reported Hagrid, which eventually led to Hagrid's arrest. Since then, the Chamber of Secrets has never been opened again. The whole thing seems to have been settled and everything has returned to normal. Listening to Dumbledore's statement, Turns already had some guesses in his mind. After making sure that Dumbledore had nothing to say, he spoke, then is this Tom Riddle Voldemort 4.4. Suddenly hearing someone link Tom Riddle and Voldemort together, Dumbledore was also very surprised. He came back from his contemplation and looked at Turns who was staring at him with burning eyes. After staring at each other for a long time, Dumbledore nodded slowly, confirming Turns' guess. That is to say, Principal Dumbledore, you also know that the person who opened the Chamber of Secrets was Tom. Ternace asked in a matter-of-fact tone. Dumbledore did not deny this, but sighed helplessly, shook his head and said with regret, yes, but what's the point of saying so much now? It's useless to bring up the past now. The current Ministry of Magic, under the leadership of Fudge, doesn't want to get involved in any story of the dead Voldemort. Turns also understood this. It was true. Fudge's character determined that it was difficult for him to bring up those old accounts, especially those that might affect his position as a minister. And for Fudge, the name Voldemort was also a taboo. No one could mention this in front of him. Mr. Turns shouldn't come to talk to me about this, right? Do you have anything to say? Turns didn't get to the point, and Dumbledore lost interest in continuing to argue with Turns, so he asked directly. After hearing Dumbledore's question, Turns no longer kept the secret and directly told his guess. Principal, since it was Voldemort who opened the secret room 50 years ago, is it possible that this time, he is still behind the scenes controlling everything? Turns told some of his guesses. Listening to Turner's words, Dumbledore fell into deep thought. Indeed, this possibility is very high. After all, a special talent like Parseltongue is not so easy to appear. In the past hundred years, two or even three have appeared directly, which is a bit abnormal. Dumbledore also has some guesses. He also suspected Voldemort. The reason why he did not expand the impact of this matter was, on the one hand, because he was worried that it would have a bad impact on Hogwarts, and on the other hand, he wanted to find out the black hand behind it. If it wasn't Voldemort, it would be fine. If it was, he could once again thwart Voldemort's conspiracy and buy time for them. That's right, in Dumbledore's heart, he has always believed that Voldemort has never been completely eliminated. He must be somewhere, waiting for the opportunity to make a comeback. And now he is old, although it has not caused too much decline in strength. In addition, with the enhancement of the Elder Wand, he is sure that he can fight Voldemort. But he is old after all. Even if he can still fight Voldemort now, what about in the future? When his strength declines too much, Voldemort will not be suppressed by him. At that time, he still needs the power of the new generation to fight against the devil. And the power of the new generation still needs a long time to grow, so what he has to do now is to buy time for them so that they can grow up. He sighed and said with some frustration, I understand all this, so now I am waiting for him to show up. If it is really just an ordinary student who accidentally opened the secret room, then it is okay. If it is really Voldemort, I will also be prepared. I will not let the students' lives be in danger here. Dumbledore said at the end, his tone was very firm, which was also the most serious performance of this old man. Looking at the old man who was already more than a hundred years old at this time, he was still trying to protect the safety of his students. Turnus couldn't help but admire him. Perhaps in some aspects, Dumbledore's handling was indeed a bit inappropriate, but as a principal, he did the best he could. And this is worthy of his reputation as the best principal in the history of Hogwarts. 
This is not because of his strength, but because of his attitude towards students. At this point, I completely believe in you, the principal. I didn't come here for this this time, but I found some suspicious places. After my thinking and investigation over the past few days, I have already found some clues about the entrance to the secret room. Turner's nodded and was willing to go with Dumbledore's assurance. Oh, do you know where it is? Dumbledore was also a little surprised. After so many years of investigation, he could only confirm the existence of the secret room and that it was in the castle, but he didn't know where it was exactly. However, he didn't expect that Turners could find the entrance to the secret room with just a little bit of information, which surprised him a little. The entrance to the secret room is in the girls' bathroom on the third floor. There is a faucet on the central washstand that has always been broken and no water flows out. There is a snake mark on the faucet above it, right there. Turners said affirmatively. If you ask him why he knew, it is that he had seen it in person, and learned some information from the past through Myrtle, and also found the place, and used the snake language to open the entrance of the secret room. However, he did not do anything else, just looked at the entrance, confirmed its location, and closed it, and did not go deeper to alert the snake. He and Dumbledore had the same idea, which was to lure the snake out of the hole and then capture the mastermind. How did you determine it? Have you opened it? Dumbledore was also highly focused at this time, waiting for Turner's answer. Turner's did not hide it, and nodded very seriously, I think you should know, Professor, I have signed a contract with the elves, and I can understand the language of most animals and plants, so I used the snake language to open the entrance of the secret room and confirmed it. Quote. Of course, I haven't been in, 687 is still the same as before, our class can still continue to wait, wait for the mastermind to appear, and then capture him. Quote. After hearing what Turnus said, Dumbledore breathed a sigh of relief. He thought that after Turnus found the place, he went straight in to find the basilisk, but it turned out that he didn't. It seems that Turnus is not a reckless person. Dumbledore was very happy about this. He was still very optimistic about Turnus. It was very likely that he and Harry would fight Voldemort together in the future. Therefore, the better Turnus performed, the happier he would be. In this way, he might be able to retire earlier. This is the best. From today on, I will have someone keep a close eye on the place. Once there is any movement, I will take action immediately. At that time, I must catch the mastermind behind this time. Dumbledore said firmly. This time, the other party did touch his bottom line. For him, Hogwarts is his bottom line, and his students are his last persistence. Now someone is joking about the safety of his students' lives, which is very annoying for him. After listening, Turnus nodded and had no opinion on it. However, he suddenly thought of something, so he asked, Then Principal Dumbledore, have you thought of any other way to deal with the eyes of the basilisk? This is a very tricky thing. Dumbledore smiled slightly. He was still very confident about this, after all, he had a phoenix in his hand. The magic resistance of the phoenix is very high, and its characteristics of rebirth from the ashes can restrain the death gaze of the basilisk. Facing the basilisk, the phoenix fox can be of great help. He looked up and looked at fox squatting on the shelf. At this time, fox was already a little old and looked old, and his breath was also very weak. However, these could not conceal the fact that he was a phoenix. This was only temporary. After he was reborn from the ashes again, it would not take long for him to regain his vitality, and it would be easy to deal with the basilisk at that time. When seeing Dumbledore's actions, Turner's also followed his gaze and found Fox's existence. In fact, he had heard that Dumbledore had a phoenix, but he had never seen it. Now that he saw it, he also felt it was very magical. A creature like the phoenix is a legend no matter where it is. Now seeing the phoenix, to be honest, Turner's was a little disappointed. This phoenix did not show the spirit of the phoenix at all. At most, it was a magical creature with the name of the phoenix. In this world, it may be considered a good magical creature, but compared with the real phoenix, it is far worse. However, he quickly hid his emotions and did not show them. After all, this phoenix, even in this world, is a very precious existence, not as bad as Turner's imagined. Besides, this is someone else's magical creature, and it has nothing to do with him. 
Dumbledore was also paying attention to Fox's condition at this time, and did not notice Turner's eyes. He is called Fox and is a phoenix. With him, he should be able to deal with the death gaze of the basilisk. As long as the basilisk loses his eyes, then its role will be very small, and it will be easier to deal with it at that time. Dumbledore said his own way to deal with it. After listening to it, Turnus felt a little bit sorry. After all, these were the eyes of the basilisk, and when this basilisk lived for thousands of years, the power of his eyes could be imagined, and it must be very terrifying. As long as he could get it, after some refining, it could at least be regarded as a legendary magic item. Of course, if his alchemy skills could be stronger, it would not be impossible to refine a divine weapon. After all, now it is just a pair of eyes, but it has such great power. As long as it is taken off, it will at least be a high-level magic item, and it will definitely be of a higher grade after refining. If such a thing is destroyed like this, Turnus will definitely not allow it. So, he suggested, Principal Dumbledore, why don't you give me the task of dealing with the basilisk? Quote. Huh. Dumbledore was stunned when he heard Turnus' words. He didn't understand what he was talking about for a moment. But when he came to his senses, he immediately reacted, impossible, you know how powerful the basilisk is, why are you so unwise? This is irresponsible for your life. I will never agree. If you still have such an idea, I will find your parents and let you stay at home for the time being, waiting for the end of this matter. Come back to school. Quote. Dumbledore's reaction was very strong, and he even forced Turnus to go home, not wanting him to be in any danger. Looking at Dumbledore like this, Turnus didn't know why he felt a little warm in his heart. Such an old man who has no relationship with you can be so worried about your safety, which is enough to show that he really cares about you. But although he was moved, Turnus's thoughts were still not shaken at all. He said this because he was sure enough, otherwise he would not say such words. No matter how good the magic props are, they are not as good as his own life after all. If he is put in danger because of the eyes of the basilisk, he himself will not agree. Turnus knew that if he didn't give enough reasons, Dumbledore would never allow him to do such a dangerous thing. Without any hesitation, Turner stood up and stepped back a few steps to make enough space in front of him. Then he began to mobilize the magic power in his body, and the magic power flowed along his arms and onto his hands. Turner's hands began to move. At the beginning, the fluctuations of the magic power were not very obvious, but soon, a carrier of the second or third knot level appeared in front of him. Turner's hands kept moving, and magic runes began to gradually spread on this carrier. In the end, two round shields appeared on Turner's arms. These two shields are completely made of magic power. Although they look very weak and give people the feeling that they will break at the touch. However, the defensive power of these two shields is very strong. Not to mention ordinary guns, even if a rocket hits them, it will not break these shields. The shield was broken. And this is just physical defense. The power of magic defense is also very strong. According to preliminary estimates, it can at least block the high-level attack spells released by intermediate magicians good ones. For advanced magicians, intermediate spells may be a little difficult, but it is no problem to block it once. Such means are enough to deal with the basilisk. The body of the basilisk is huge, but the physical attack it can burst out is at most equivalent to a rocket. It can't be blocked for a long time. If it's only 10 minutes, there is no problem. As for the basilisk's killer weapon, the pair of death staring eyes, it is even simpler. Turners can fight the basilisk with his eyes closed. Don't forget that he can use the domineering color of observation, so he doesn't need vision. Although he is a little uncomfortable, he can fight. Professor, why don't you try my defense method? Turners raised his shield excitedly and showed his head to Dumbledore. This is indeed a capital for showing off. The magic he is releasing now is magic of different systems. He learned it all by himself with the help of a book. Without a teacher, being able to learn the bearing and construction of two or three knots so quickly is already a very good talent. Dumbledore was a little curious when he saw Turnus tinkering with it for a long time and making such a two-sided magic round shield. It's not that he is curious about what kind of magic this is. In fact, magic used in melee combat has appeared in this world but it has gradually been replaced by the current magic system in the later evolution. 
He is curious about how Ternas learned such magic, and how powerful such magic is, which actually gave Ternas the courage to challenge the basilisk. Your melee magic is indeed interesting, but Ternas, I have to warn you that the enemy you are facing this time cannot be dealt with by such simple melee magic. Dumbledore did not try the defensive ability of the magic shield as Ternas said. After hearing what Dumbledore said, he knew that Dumbledore had misunderstood him. Indeed, the opponent this time was a very powerful basilisk. The size of the basilisk 727, which had lived for thousands of years, was conceivably very large. In Dumbledore's mind, even the melee magic in the last great era of magic would not have much effect. After all, as long as they were magical creatures, their magic resistance and magic attack were proportional, and they were very powerful. Moreover, as time went by, they would only become stronger. Unless they entered a period of decline, their strength would not regress. Turners explained, Principal Dumbledore, my magic is not that simple. You only need to try the defense of the magic shield. Later, I will explain to you the real reason why I want to deal with the basilisk. Dumbledore looked at Turners' stubborn little face and was helpless. He could only draw out his wand and prepare to let Turners give up. Dumbledore casually released an offensive magic, which was not of high level, and he did not use much magic power, just to teach Turners a lesson, he did not want to make a mistake. Really hurt Turners. As the magic shot out from the top of Dumbledore's old wand, a silver-white magic attacked Turners' magic shield. When the magic hit the shield on Turners' arm, the magic shield on Turners' arm produced ripples, and the magic inscriptions on the shield all lit up in an instant, consuming Turners' magic power to offset this magic attack. In just one second, Dumbledore's magic was offset by the magic inscriptions on the magic shield in some mysterious way. This move shocked Dumbledore. You know, although he was not serious just now, and the offensive magic he used was not very powerful, but with his strength, combined with the old wand, even if he was not serious. The power that can be exerted by that magic is not something that an ordinary intermediate magician can overcome. In other words, Turners only used the magic shield in his hand to resist an attack from a senior magician. And Turners only took one second to completely eliminate such an attack. Think about it more deeply. Turners needs one second to attack like this, which means that in this second, Turners can withstand two attacks from a senior magician in succession. But we also need to consider the question of how many times a senior magician can attack in one second. Dumbledore tells you with his rich experience that being able to attack once a second is considered great. Of course, Dumbledore's idea is still magic with the same attack strength as his. Perhaps many wizards who have not inherited and have only relied on their own talents to improve themselves may have their own specialties, but it is certain that those who can cast magic with the same attack strength as Dumbledore just now are also the best among them. Looking at Turnus like this, Dumbledore suddenly realized that he seemed to be really old. Are children nowadays so scary? A 13-year-old child can have the strength of a senior magician. How can an old man like him live? Turnus, how long can your magic shield last? Dumbledore is worthy of being a wizard. He quickly thought of a key issue, that is, the sustainability of magic. If a powerful magic is not sustainable enough, then the combat power it can exert is ultimately limited. And the effect of this magic is not as great as imagined. To maintain this magic, it does not require too much magic power. Only when resisting magic or force attacks, will magic power be consumed to offset the attack. If it is the magic you just used, I can resist it more than a hundred times. Magic power will still be consumed, but when not facing an attack, the magic power consumed is very little. With Turna's natural affinity physique, the magic power recovery speed is even faster than the consumption speed of these two magic shields. So, Turna's has no pressure to maintain magic. Dumbledore nodded very happily and said with a smile, That's good, this magic is really amazing. I didn't expect you to be able to get such an inheritance. It seems that you also have your own opportunities. Obviously, at this moment, Dumbledore has made up a lot of things in his mind. Turnas is happy to see this, which also saves him a lot of explanation. But, just when Turnas was happy, Dumbledore's but made Turnas confused. He didn't know what Dumbledore was butting. Dumbledore continued, if this is your confidence, then I can only say that you are too naive. 
The basilisk cannot be dealt with by relying on these two shields. I still cannot agree. There were several black lines on Turnus's forehead. Obviously, Dumbledore misunderstood and thought that he wanted to rely on these two shields to deal with the basilisk. But Turner's is not someone who can deal with the basilisk with just these two tortoise shells. Principal, you misunderstood me. The reason why I used these two shields is to show you that I can protect myself from the basilisk. I have other means to deal with the basilisk, not relying on this. Turner's explained helplessly. Dumbledore couldn't help blushing slightly after hearing this. He also understood that he underestimated Turner's. It turned out that Turner's had other means. Dumbledore didn't speak again, but just stretched out his hand to ask him to continue to use his means. Principal, I have an ability that can detect the movements within a certain range around me without relying on my eyes. I rely on this method to avoid the magic of the basilisk's eyes. Hearing Turner's words, Dumbledore was shocked again. He didn't know how many times he was shocked tonight. He couldn't help but stare at Turner's to see if what he said was true. Turner's didn't waste words. He took out a piece of cloth from his pocket and covered his eyes. Then he said, Principal, my eyes have been covered. If you don't believe it, you can check it yourself. No need for that. I still believe you. You won't joke with me here with your life. Dumbledore was already somewhat convinced that Turnus had such magical abilities. However, he still wanted to confirm it again. Without waiting for Turnus to invite him to experiment, he directly attacked Turnus with magic balls one after another. After Turnus noticed all this, he didn't get annoyed. He covered his eyes and moved left and right under Dumbledore's magic attack. If he really couldn't avoid it, he would use the magic shield in his hand to block the attack. In the continuous attack of more than 10 seconds, there was no mistake, and every time he could avoid Dumbledore's attack just right. Later, Dumbledore even used magic to throw the debris around him at Turner's, obviously wanting to test whether any attack could be sensed. Obviously Turner's perception did not disappoint him. No matter what kind of attack, at what angle and in what way, Turner's could block or avoid it when it came. To be honest, even if Dumbledore saw it with his own eyes, he couldn't believe it. At this time, Dumbledore also stopped his actions. After all, he had proved this point, so there was no need to waste time. Okay Turner's, you have proved that you have the ability to deal with the basilisk. Although it is helpless, I can't stop a wizard who dares to fight from participating in the battle against evil. But please promise me that you must take your own safety as the first principle. Once there is danger, it is better to escape than to fight to the death. Dumbledore said these words with great care. He really didn't want to go to a student like Turner's, and a student with outstanding talents and means, which was even more important. I understand, Principal, I am not a person who doesn't take my life seriously. Turner's promised. This is the best. Then in the next period of time, I will pay more attention to the entrance of the secret room. If there are any problems, I will inform you. If you have any situation, you can also come to me directly. Well, then, I will leave first, Professor. Turner's stood up and said goodbye. Since that conversation, Turner's has focused on his studies. The current second year courses naturally cannot attract Turner's attention. However, the magic knowledge from other worlds made him deeply addicted to it. Recently, he got a magic book from the Marvel world. The name of the book is, The Key of Solomon. This is a book about Solomon's life. Of course, it also contains a lot of Solomon's magic. The most famous one is that he sealed the 72 demons through the sealing technique, and then borrowed the power of the demons to fight. Therefore, Many of these magics are related to each other. This is related to the setting of Solomon in the Marvel world. In the Marvel world, Solomon is set as a person with a very high magic talent. He created his own magic system from scratch. By extracting the power of the 72 sealed demons, he fights and gives his believers the power of the emperor. But in the end, it seems that his scene is quite miserable. He was pitted by the 72 demons together, resulting in a very bleak result. The whole country fell apart because of this. Of course, there is not much introduction about Solomon's ending in this magic book, but there are many warnings to readers not to be too obsessed with using other people's power. Solomon's sealing magic is related to many other branches of magic, and many branches of magic need sealing magic to be used. 
In other words, he first needs to seal some creatures before he can use many of the magic. The magic in this magic book is very advanced, far from what Turnus can use now. However, there are also many stories about Solomon's characters, so Turnus just read it as a storybook. Of course, some of them are Solomon's understanding of magic. Solomon is also a master of magic. His magic is based on some inheritance, and then developed, and many magics are created by himself. Many of the magic concepts in it are very inspiring and have inspired Turnus a lot. In addition, there is a lot of alchemy knowledge in it, which is also very interesting to Turnus. In this magic book, Turnus learned a lot, and he admired Solomon's magic talent very much. Although he couldn't use many of the magic in it, at least not yet, and there were some that he couldn't learn for the time being, but he believed that he would be able to use them one day in the future. And there was also a very special magic in it, which could not be considered magic, but a contract. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and support our channel.